this has been a very eventful weekend in the wrestling industry. A very eventful day as I was preparing to get everything sorted here for the payback review tonight. Big WWE pay-per-view. Tomorrow night is the AEW pay-per-view. We had some news that dropped on us earlier today. Has nothing to do with WWE. But we had some uh, very big news. CM Punk has been banned from Collision. I know. I know. I mean, everybody else is already banned, so why not add him to the list? I'm sure you've all heard the news by now. CM Punk has been terminated by AEW. He is no longer a member of the roster. I am going to talk about CM Punk. We're going to be doing that in a little bit. Because right now we have to focus on this event. This WWE pay-per-view of which he was not part. But tonight was WWE Payback. And Payback was a show that on paper looked like the weakest lineup for any WWE PLE that they have hosted all year. And they have had a string of of excellent pay-per-views going back to the beginning of the year. But on paper, this one just felt like a very mid-show. This felt like a B-show going into it. And part of that is the fact that there was no bloodline, there was no Roman Reigns scheduled for the show, uh, which was very unusual. But it presented an opportunity, I think, for the rest of the roster to step up and for WWE for a change to finally put some real focus on something other than the bloodline coming into tonight's show. So again, it was it was a weak lineup overall coming into it. In execution, now that the show is over, Payback on the whole was a good show that had two outstanding matches. One of those outstanding matches was the undisputed tag team championship match. It was a Steel City street fight. They were in Pittsburgh tonight. Kevin Owens and Sami Zayn defending their titles against the Judgment Day, Finn Balor and Damian Priest. Insert joke here about how many times we've seen this match over and over and over again on TV. But now we got it on pay-per-view. They were able to go out there uninterrupted, no commercials. They had the basically extreme rules stipulation, which is what it was. And those four guys, and I'll, I'll credit Rhea and Dominic as well, because they, they also played their part. J.D. McDonough played a part in that match. They booked that match perfectly. And they went out there and they killed each other. They had about as hardcore of a hardcore match as you could expect in modern day WWE. I I know that to AEW, this basically was a a rampage main event. But uh, I thought it was excellent. And when it was over, we had new tag team champions. Kevin Owens and Sami Zayn, who beat the Usos in the main event of WrestleMania to win those titles, have finally lost those titles. Finn Balor and Damian Priest are your new tag team champions. And uh, perhaps that will bring some harmony back to the Judgment Day, but I'm sure this will only lead to more drama down the line. We'll have to see how that plays out on TV. But the other outstanding match on this show is a match that I was not expecting to be as great as it was. And it was my second favorite match of the entire show. It was the opening match between Becky Lynch and Trish Stratus. Now, you don't need me to sit here and tell you how underwhelming this feud has been over these past several months. You probably agree with me. Maybe you don't agree with me. I have been nonplussed by this feud all the way through. I think it's been very underwhelming. There have been some very cringe promos on television. It just has not clicked in the way that I think they expected it to click. But they say it's not how you start, it's how you finish. And this felt like the blow-off to me of this feud. They finish as strong as you can possibly finish. These two women went out there, and they absolutely destroyed each other. They had an excellent match with Becky Lynch going over and handing the loss to Trish Stratus, Trish's first cage match of her career. And I don't know if this is going to be it for Trish Stratus. I really don't. I don't know if this is going to be it for her. I don't know if this is going to be her retirement match. I haven't really heard that this is going to be her final match. But if this was... To be Trish's final match, she couldn't pick a better match to go out on. I will say that much. She could not pick a better match to go out on. So I thought both of those matches were fantastic. Those really were the highlights of the show. The other thing about this show also was we had a big angle, a little interesting development involving Jey Uso, who quit WWE only a few weeks ago on SmackDown. Well, Jey Uso was back 
And Jay Uso is now a member of the Monday Night Raw roster, thanks to Cody Rhodes, who was on the Grayson Waller effect. So we had a little interesting development there involving Jay Uso, and I have a, I have an idea, I have a sense of where this could potentially be headed. And in the main event, we had Seth Rollins defending his World Heavyweight Championship against Shinsuke Nakamura, with the focus being the, the bad back of Seth Rollins. The lower lumbar fractures, that was the story they told coming into tonight. And there was nothing inherently wrong with the work in the main event. It was a good match. But it was, it was very underwhelming. And the way that they went off the air on this pay-per-view, there was a bit of an awkward uh, final, I would say, 30 seconds or so at the end of the show that made you think that somebody was coming out or somebody was about to do something. Whether it was Nakamura was going to attack Rollins again, or maybe we might get a money in the bank cash in. And that didn't happen. And they just sort of went off the air in a, in a bit of an awkward fashion. Um, I was expecting more. You know, it was a good match, but it was, to me, it was no different than a match you would see, like a long television main event on Monday Night Raw. Uh, to close out the pay-per-view with this match, I just was underwhelmed by how they went off the air. So I think when you look back on this show, it was a series of, you know, good matches, but two outstanding matches that I would tell people if you didn't see it to go out of your way to watch. Uh, so when it was over, I thought, you know, overall, Payback will probably go down as one of the weaker cards of this year, as I thought it would be. Uh, but that's in a year where WWE, for the most part, has really knocked it out of the park. Tonight just kind of felt, for the most part, like, all right, this is your standard B-show fare from WWE as we are biding our time until Roman Reigns decides that it's time for him to come back and defend his championship again. And I'm not even sure if we're going to get a Roman Reigns title match again this year. <laughs> for all we know, he may end up maybe in some kind of multi-man match at Survivor Series. He may not even be on the card at Survivor Series. We don't know. Uh, but it was a chance for some other people tonight to step up, LA Knight being one of those people. So we're going to go through uh, everything that happened here on this show. This is your WWE Payback Review. Payback 2023. Here for September 2nd, 2023. I am the Solomon Monster. Like and subscribe. We are climbing ever so closer to 75,000 subscribers here on this channel. And I know many of you are already Look subbed. But if you're Richie not... Rich over here dropping oh. all this money on Oh me. boy, coming in hot here. You're I not even letting me get know. into this here. I think you rock. I don't mean the rock, a rock. You rock. And I just wanted you to know that. Oh, man. Is that our boy? It is. It is our boy, ABK. ABK is getting started early here tonight on the stream, ladies and gentlemen. It's ABK. Always be killing it. Always be killing it. ABK. He's been making appearances left and right here on this channel tonight. Why should tonight be any different? ABK, thank you for that $100 super chat getting us started. And there, of course is CM Punk, despite the firing, still banning people from collision. Look at this. Bobby's World, thank you. ABK, man, thank you, brother. I was about to say Super Chats are open, and uh, you can get them on in. I'm going to be reading your messages, whatever they may be about. The news of the day, payback, whatever it may be. If you got comments, questions, uh, send them on in. We'll hang out a little bit later. 500 likes is the goal for Be The Booker which is a little thing we do here at the end of these streams if we hit our goal. Also, I got to give a shout out here, Metal Rules. Metal Rules dropped a uh, $50 bomb on me before I went live, so I want to acknowledge that. And uh, I want to thank him for that as well. You guys are killing it. So let's talk about this Payback show because we got a lot to get into here. Payback opened with a steel cage match between Becky Lynch and Trish Stratus. As I said before, the very first cage match of Trish Stratus's career. In all the years that Trish Stratus has been in WWE the first time, plus her most recent run, never been in a cage Look match everyone. before. It's she was Samoa in her bro. first ever ladder match of Money in the Bank. And so tonight she got to check another one off of her bucket list. Before the match, they showed the NXT Women's Champion Trish, uh, or not Trish, uh, Tiffany Stratton. <laughs> Maybe that's next for Trish. Tiffany Stratton was with her title in the crowd. They showed her there. Michael Cole claimed that she was scouting main roster talent because there is not enough competition for her in NXT. 
And uh, we're going to come back to Tiffany Stratton because she would make another appearance later on in the show. There were a lot of throws into the side of the cage from both sides early on in this match. Midway through the match, Trisha's forehead was all bruised up, and she had a lump right in the middle of her forehead. So she must have gotten thrown into the cage a little too hard. She looked, she looked like she was getting the life beaten out of her here in this match. Stratus climbed over Becky, tried to escape the cage. Becky brought her back down, power bombed her for a two count. We had a this is awesome chant in the middle of this match. This would not be the only time that the fans in Pittsburgh would be chanting this is awesome. And it was well deserved because they were firing on all cylinders here. They really were. Becky went for the disarm her. Trish countered into a widow's peak for a two count. She didn't just do the widow's peak. What was cool about this is Trish actually did the uh, mannerism that Victoria used to do, you know, because she was all crazy. And so Victoria would go like this and she would act like a crazy person. Uh, Trish did that as well after hitting the move. Before going for the pin, uh, Becky kicked out. And Michael Cole mentioned on commentary, he pointed out the fact that the very first steel cage match involving the ladies in WWE took place many years ago involving Lita and Victoria. And that Trish was paying homage to Victoria there using her finishing move. Becky immediately followed that with a twist of fate, which was a callback to Lita, who was the other half of that match. She got a near fall of her own. Trish popped up. She landed a Stratus Faction Bulldog for another good near fall. Trish then went up top. She was once again trying to escape the cage, because those are the rules in WWE. WWE has always done escape the cage rules. So she tried to get out. Becky followed her. And pulled. now I should stop there for a second, actually. She was trying to escape multiple times, so I assume, because I did not pay attention to the match announcements when they did the uh, introduction. So if they did not announce that as one of the rules for the match, somebody will correct me. Typically in WWE, you can do pinfall, you can do submission, or you can do escape the cage. So I am assuming that this match didn't work any differently as it normally would, especially as many times as Trish tried to escape. I assume that was uh, one of the rules here of the match. So she tried to escape again. Becky followed her, pulled her back to the top rope, and Becky slammed her head against the cage a couple of times. Becky set up for the manhandle slam. Trish stuffed the move and performed a bulldog from the top rope, which got her a, a hot near fall. Fans were into the near falls in this match. I mean, they were, they were really with these women and everything they were doing. Trish tried to escape over the top of the cage. Becky caught up to her, and they both ended up seated on top of the cage. And Trish headbutted Becky. Becky punched Trish. And at that point, Trish fell backwards. Oh, look at this. It's the dancing robot, everybody. It's Paul Hamilton with the dancing robot. He knew it was a big pay-per-view night, so he wanted the robot on the dance floor. Paul Hamilton. Holy shit, $150 bomb. Nice to see Becky and Trish knock it out of the park. Paul, thank you very much, my friend, the Portland pop star, all the way out west, showing some love. They were. They were knocking it out of the park tonight. You're absolutely right. But this was one of the uh, sort of highlights of the match. Trish falls backwards. Her legs are wedged in between. Now, they have that apparatus on the top of the cage that is up there to lower it and raise it back up. That kind of steel beam that goes around the uh, perimeter of the cage. So she was safe. You know, her legs were, were sort of wedged in there. And she falls backwards, so now her body is dangling backwards over the cage. It kind of reminded me of, if you think back to SummerSlam back in 94, the cage was very different back then because they had the blue bar cage. So for the finish, as Brett and Owen are, are kind of jockeying for position and trying to climb down, Owen had his legs in the squares of the cage and fell backwards and was dangling. And then Brett jumps down and wins the match. So it was a very similar spot here, only Trish was up a lot higher than uh, Owen was in that match. 
So Trish pulls her back up, and she gets her back inside the or she gets back inside the cage. Becky is standing on the ropes, on the top rope. Trish is still on top, but now she's dangling over inside. Becky gets her in a suplex position, and she gives Trish Stratus a superplex. Even though Becky's on the top rope, Trish is on the top of the cage. And her body is hanging down, and I'm kind of holding my breath here, because if she were to come down straight down, it's going to be catastrophic, right? Because she could fall straight down on top of her head. Thankfully, she got the rotation. She got superplexed from the top of the cage, took this huge bump. Now, keep in mind, Trish Stratus is not a full-time wrestler anymore. Trish Stratus is 47 years old, and she is taking a superplex from the top of a probably 10 or 12 foot high steel cage. So that was very impressive. And again, the fans uh, popped huge. Becky draped her arm over Trish. Trish got her shoulder up at the very last second for the kick out. Becky then climbed to the top of the cage. Trish started to crawl on the other side towards the cage door. So Becky sees this. She drops down. She goes to stop her when Zoe Stark shows up. Zoe grabs Trish. She reaches in. She's trying to pull her outside. Becky is on the other side trying to pull Trish back in. And they're pulling her back and forth. And finally, Becky wins out. And she drags Trish back to the middle of the ring. As Becky walks towards the door, Zoe grabs the cage door and she slams it on Becky's head. And Becky goes backwards. The momentum sends her backwards. Trish grabs her, rolls her up, and gets a near fall out of it. Becky comes right back, though, hits a manhandle slam. She had the pin, but Zoe runs in, and she breaks up the pin. And I know, I know, cage match, supposed to keep people out. Well, we all knew how that would go. Becky gets up, and there's two of them, and there's one of her. So instead of leaving the cage, or r running away, Becky grabs the door, and she slams the door shut behind her. So she's not backing down from a fight, even though it's two on one. She stares at Zoe. Zoe stares back at her. The two of them start fighting. Meanwhile, Trish is scaling the cage. So Becky hits a manhandle slam on Zoe Stark. She races up the cage to stop Trish from escaping. And Becky hits a manhandle slam from the top rope. Slams her down to the mat, covers her, and gets the three count at the 20-minute mark of what was an excellent match. Once Becky leaves, so she, she exits the cage, she leaves. Trish and Zoe are now alone in the ring, and they stop the music. So you know there's going to be some kind of an angle here. And she's trying to help Trish up, and Trish, is she doesn't want her help. She's very upset. She lost the match. Zoe was supposed to help her. It backfired. It didn't work. So she doesn't want to, even though Zoe's trying to help her. She doesn't want her help. And Trish is talking back to her. And Zoe is trying to, you know, explain to her, you know, I made a mistake. I'm sorry. So finally, she slaps Zoe and tells her to leave. Zoe goes to leave, but instead she grabs the door and she closes it. And now she's pissed. And she turns back around towards Trish. And she's, you know, mouthing off to Trish. After everything I've done for you, this is how you treat me. This is how you talk to me. And she starts to uh, get poked. Trish is poking her in the chest. So finally, Zoe grabs her. And she hits a very clean-looking Z360, which is her finish. Takes Trish over completely. Hits her with the knee strike to the face. Lays out Trish. And Zoe pulls off her Thank You Trish t-shirt, throws it down. And you can hear some, you know, light applause from the crowd as she uh, leaves. I thought they were going to go a totally different way with this. This this felt to me like they were going to try to turn Trish back babyface. By having Zoe attack her and really viciously just beat the crap out of her. And then Becky would come back and Becky would save Trish. Because she feels bad for her. You know, even though begrudgingly, but she still has respect for her. She comes back, fights off Zoe, and Trish is back to being a babyface. Um, they didn't do that. And it was, seems like what they tried to do here is turn Zoe babyface. And, you know, give her the rub by, by doing that. She's sick of Trish's crap. She's not going to take orders from her anymore. 
And so I, I would... I shouldn't assume. I mean, we'll see what, what they want her to be. She could still be a heel, just not associated with Trish. But this was the uh, official ending of the alliance between Trish Stratus and Zoe Stark. I have given these two women a lot of shit for a very underwhelming feud. And I take back none of it, because everything I have been saying about this feud is 100% true in my mind. It has been very underwhelming. It has consistently been some, in some cases, the worst segments on the show. There are weeks where the crowd, I mean, you can have Trish in the ring cutting a promo, and she has cut some really bad promos out there uh, in the ring. Having said that, they were left off the SummerSlam card. And you know that it bothered both of them. Becky posted that thing on Instagram about, you know, life hands you lemons, you make lemonade. She turned it into a t-shirt so she can make some money off of it. But you know, you know it bothered them. The fact that they were left off this big stadium show, it had to bother them. On Monday, Becky and Zoe went out. They had a really good main event. I had a lot of positive things to say about their main event on Monday night. Trish even took some big bumps during that match. Tonight, these two women went out there, and they killed it. Now, I don't know, as I said before, if this is going to be it for Trish Stratus or not. It didn't feel like it to me. She may be sticking around. But if this was the end for Trish Stratus, this would be a hell of a way for her to go out. Her very first cage match, to go out there and get that kind of response and put in that kind of performance. I can't think of a better way for her to go out. She would be going out on a high note if she wanted to. Now, having people constantly interfere in cage matches, even though the whole purpose of a cage match really is supposed to be to keep people from uh, getting into the cage, it's become a running joke in wrestling. It doesn't matter what promotion it is. There's, there's always somebody who's getting inside the cage. They're going through the door. They're climbing in over the top. It's, it's just it's like a, a parody at this point. Um, but they did it here to set up the post-match angle. Zoe had to get involved. It had to backfire so that they can do what they did when the match was over and have her lay out Trish. So I understand why they did it. But with that, this feud is finally over. And as I said before, it's not about how you start. It's about how you finish. And these two ladies should take a bow because they finished in the strongest possible way. This was one of the best matches of the entire night. So then we had John Cena, who did not open the show, even though he was the host. They had the cage match go first. And then they sent out John Cena, the official host of Payback, introduced as he always is now as the greatest of all time. Every time John Cena makes an appearance, he is the greatest of all time. That is how WWE wants you to know that John Cena is the greatest of all time. So he welcomed the fans. He said the first match was awesome. Talked about the various things he's done over the years in WWE. Said the one thing he's never been is the host. And he said that his job is to not only host, but make it a special night. So he said that tonight he would be the special guest referee for one of the matches on the show. And he said it's the match that he was really paying very close attention to, which was LA Knight against The Miz. And as soon as he said The Miz's name, almost on cue... We heard the Miz's theme music, and out he comes to the ring. Miz said that he would expect Knight to pander to the fans, but not John Cena. Proving that Miz clearly does not actually watch any of these shows and has not paid attention to any of these shows for the last 15 years. <laughs> because that's all John Cena ever does, is pander to the crowd. So I don't know what the hell Miz was uh, talking about there. He said that John Cena sucks as the host. Cena said Miz has a lot of hosting experience, and he asked him for some advice. Miz said that Cena shouldn't make himself the special referee for his match. His other advice is that when you're called to play the merman in the Barbie movie, you say no. Now, I know the story behind this, because Margot Robbie actually told the story. She was out to lunch one day. And I guess Cena was filming a movie in the same place that she was and didn't realize it. And I think um, as she told the story, she, she went to go pay for her meal and they said it was already paid for. 
John Cena was there. John Cena already paid for your meal. So she went over to go talk to Cena. She said, hey, you want to be a merman? We're doing Barbie. He goes, sure. If Margot Robbie asks you to do something, no man is going to say no. So I don't fault John Cena for being a merman. I'd be a fucking mermaid if she wanted me to be. If Margot Robbie says, hey, you want to do something? You do it. So I don't fault John Cena for that at all. So Cena said, look, he doesn't like Miz, but he respects him. He said that he was seeking his advice. Miz said Cena needs to be more involved. And Miz remembered being in two matches when he hosted WrestleMania. He also said that he wore a suit. Whereas John Cena is almost 50 years old and he's out here looking like a Teletubby. Cena said that all of Miz's advice seemed to add up to his idea of being the special referee for his match. And Miz said that Cena doesn't even have a referee shirt. They had a production member hand John Cena a referee shirt. And so it was official. He would be the special referee. And he introduced, he pointed to the stage and introduced L.A. Knight, who came out to a big pop. So we had John Cena as the special referee for The Miz against L.A. Knight. Not a single 30-year-old to be found. L.A. Knight was the youngest man in the ring. Tons of stalling by The Miz. This was like old school heat. Just kept ducking out of the ring. He'd come back. He would duck out again. This was like the first three minutes of the match. So finally, Miz is, uh, he's going to leave. Knight chases him down the aisle, fights him all the way back to the ring. So Miz worked overnight on the outside guardrail. He ran at LA Knight. Knight backdropped him. And Miz took a pretty hard bump over the timekeeper's barricade onto the concrete floor. There's no padding over there. So he took a back body drop onto the floor. The two of them made their way back into the ring. Miz tried to put the boots to him, but John Cena pulled Miz off of Knight. Knight got the upper hand, and then Cena pulled Knight off of Miz. And so we had a little interaction in the ring between John Cena and L.A. Knight where they got up in each other's face. Miz landed a series of it kicks, or yes kicks, whatever he's calling them these days. He went for another one. Knight countered with a high back suplex. They both got to their feet. Knight hit a bulldog from the second rope. Miz came back. He came charging at L.A. Knight. L.A. Knight moved out of the way, and he landed a swinging neckbreaker for a two-count. Miz came back. He rolled Knight up, but he held onto the ropes for leverage, and John Cena saw this. So John Cena walked over. He kicked his hand off the rope. Miz and Cena had words. Knight came at him. Miz moved out of the way, and L.A. Knight stopped short of running into John Cena. Miz then hit the skull-crushing finale, but Miz only got a two-count out of it. Miz did the you-can't-see-me thing to mock Cena, but Knight popped up. He slammed the Miz, then he hit the ropes, did his little leaping elbow drop that he does, and he followed that with the blunt force trauma for the win. This was the longest match that we have seen LA Knight in, I'm pretty sure the longest match, that he has had of his main roster run in WWE. It sure felt like it. Uh, And so... This was the first chance for us to really see him in a longer match than we're accustomed to seeing him in. And, you know, he looked fine, Miz looked fine, but that's the word that I would kind of use to describe this match. It was fine. It was nothing special. It wasn't bad, but it wasn't, you know, anything that I'm going to tell you, oh, you got to go see it. It was a match. That's really what it was. It was a match. After the match was over, Knight is over on the stage, and John Cena is with him. And they're looking, they're eyeballing each other. And Knight's getting up in his face and he's jawing at him. And so John Cena, he goes to take his referee shirt off. He has some trouble taking it off. Yeah, Cena, he usually, you know, back in the day, he would grab his sleeve. And I can never understand how he did this. I would try it right now here on the stream, but uh, I don't, I don't want to blind you. But he would grab his sleeve and in one motion, he would just pull the shirt off his head. And I'm like, how the fuck does he do that? So he went to go do it, and it didn't work. So then he went to go take the shirt off the normal way, and he still had trouble because he was wearing the Vince McMahon referee shirt, which is too tight for him to be wearing. (laughs) It's it's too tight. His shirt is too tight, Billy. He was trying to get the shirt off. He couldn't get it off. Finally, he gets the shirt off, and he goes face-to-face with Knight, and Cena puts his hand out for a handshake. And Knight still doesn't trust him. He's still drawing at him, and then finally L.A. Knight accepts the handshake, 
John Cena raises his arm, and you could hear Cena tell him, this is your moment. And Cena walked to the back, left him to soak in the cheers from the crowd. The match went 15 minutes. This match did not need to go 15 minutes. They could have shaved, easily shaved five minutes off of this match. Uh, it was definitely feeling long. And Knight, my other issue with this also is LA Knight should not be struck. And I understand Miz is a former WWE champion, right? Miz has held every title there is to hold. I, I understand. Main event at WrestleMania, which don't remind me. But the Miz is also one for 24. Or at least he was coming into this show. I think now he's one for 25 in matches this year. That's his record. Prior to tonight, where he lost again, he won one match on television. That's it. It might have been against uh, Tommaso Ciampa. I don't remember who it was. Miz is a glorified job guy. Now, Miz is a good guy to go in there with. He's a guy you can beat, who's had some success. But he's not a guy that L.A. Knight should be struggling that much with when he's having a year where he went 1 for 24 coming into this pay-per-view. So like I said, this match, you could have shaved an easy five minutes off of it. But it was solid for what it was. Uh, adding Cena to the match did not add anything to the match. Uh, what it did do, though, when the match was over, the key moment was on stage. When you had that little confrontation between L.A. Knight and John Cena, and John Cena puts his hand out for the handshake, and then he raises his arm... That's his way of endorsing L.A. Knight. That's WWE's way of saying, hey, we only have John Cena for a limited time. He's going to be on television off and on through the end of October. They're going to have him for a while, but when he's gone, who knows when we're going to see him again, right? He's in, he's out. So you have to try to make the most of the time that you have with John Cena. For them to use Cena in a way to give rub to L.A. Knight says a lot about the fact that they really are putting their muscle behind L.A. Knight. They're giving him the ball to run with. And I hope that he runs as far and as fast as he possibly can with it. Because this is an opportunity that he needs to make the most of. He has to prove to them that he belongs in that main event picture. He's not in the main event yet, but he may get there. The reactions he's getting, he's getting main event superstar reactions. He's getting the kind of reactions that world heavyweight champions get. But he's not quite there yet. This was another step in the process. So that was a big deal for WWE to use John Cena in a way to give rub to LA Knight. That was the key moment for him. It wasn't anything that happened in the ring. It was that post-match moment. But as far as the match itself, you know, he passed the test. This was some sort of test for him. He passed the test. But the match was... Solid at best. I wouldn't really say anything more beyond that. We had Rey Mysterio one-on-one -on -one with Austin Theory for the United States Championship. Eric says they're treating LA Knight like he's a rookie. Well, you got to remember, this is also the company that when AJ Styles came in, what were they? What was the name they gave him? Wasn't it the Redneck Rookie? I believe. I believe that was the name they were using for AJ Styles. How many years was AJ Styles in the business at that point in 2016? <laughs> All right, probably over 15 years. Pretty sure they were calling him the redneck rookie. Because when you come to WWE and you come to the main roster and they start to push you, as far as they're concerned, you're a rookie. It's like you're starting from scratch. You got Now you got to do it the WWE way. That's just how they view things. So yeah, to them, LA Knight is is basically a rookie. Rey Mysterio and Austin Theory. Rey came out with the LWO. They were all wearing PWO shirts, and I was completely confused. It took me a few seconds to register that it was a Pittsburgh thing. There, there was about 15 seconds there where I said, did I miss something here? I saw SmackDown last night. There were no big storyline developments. We had we, the NWO. We had the BWO in ECW. We had the LWO. Now we have the PWO, and I wasn't exactly sure what the hell was going on here, but that was the uh, Pittsburgh World Order. So, boy, they're really milking those NWO uh, trademarks, aren't they? Trying to make as much money off that as they can. You know what, though? It's, it's very similar to what they would do when Brock Lesnar had the Suplex City t-shirts. They had a, a different Suplex City shirt for every city they were in. 
and they probably made a fuck ton of money off of it. So I can't really fault them for it. But speaking of making money, something else about this match. The match was sponsored by Cinnamon Toast Crunch. Now, correct me if I'm wrong. Wasn't the Rey Mysterio match at WrestleMania this year also sponsored by Cinnamon Toast Crunch? Is he is he the official, like, sponsor of Cinnamon Toast Crunch for them? So they had Cinnamon Toast Crunch uh, logos all over the LED barricades for the entire match. And for the entirety of the match, they had Cinnamon Toast Crunch, the logo, the little cinnamon animated uh, characters on the Jumbotron. And I'm pretty sure they kept it up there for the entire duration of it, which was very distracting. <laughs> Whenever we would get a shot, and in the background, it's all lit up with Cinnamon Toast Crunch. I'm surprised they didn't have the wrestlers, you know, take a moment during the actual match to uh, start having some Cinnamon Toast Crunch. Maybe throw some at each other. So it was kind of obnoxious, but get used to it. Get used to it, because you're going to be seeing more of it, especially in the next few weeks. That Endeavor deal is going to close. It's going to become official. Endeavor will will officially own WWE, and this is the sort of thing you're going to start to see more of. In fact, I wouldn't be surprised if by WrestleMania next year, we have Cinnamon Toast Crunch logos on the ring mats. It's only a matter of time. So Theory got off a hard clothesline, series of fishermen's uh, suplexes here. Then he worked the always exciting chin lock. Theory threw Mysterio sternum first into the top turnbuckle, tried to rip off his mask, tried to pull a penta on him. Mysterio fought out of it, though, hit him with the top rope moonsault. Theory ended up at ringside. Ray slid under the bottom rope and hit a tornado DDT on the floor. Back inside, Ray executed a seated senton, went for a 619, but Theory avoided it. Ray went for a move from the middle rope. Theory caught him on his shoulders and hit a spinning sit-out powerbomb for a near fall. Theory then performed a rolling drop kick. Ray bounced off the ropes after taking the drop kick. He hit a seated uh, Austin Theory with one of his own. Moments later, Ray connected with a 619. And he went for a springboard splash. But as he came down for the springboard splash, Theory got the knees up. And he powered up Ray for the A-Town down finish. It was a really smooth transition, too, when he got the knees up and rolled immediately into the next move. Ray countered it, though, into a roll-up, and he pinned him in 10 minutes to retain the championship. After the match was over, Santos Escobar, Zelina Vega, Cruz del Toro, Joaquin Wilde, they came back out. They celebrated with Ray. Escobar hoisted him up on his shoulders. There was... Oh, dear Lord. Oh, my God. A lot of dancing here. We have the dancing robot. Now we have dancing me. And I'm a terrible dancer, so that's actually bad news for all of you. Oh my. It's ABK. Always be killing it. ABK with a $205 super chat. Dropping it. Here on this pay-per-view stream, PLE, right? Premium live event. We got some premium live super chats coming in. ABK is leading the pack. ABK is buying stock in the Sala Monster Sounds Off. He's my, he's my biggest investor over the last week. We have some foreign investors here in this show. ABK is uh, outshining all of them. Hey, ABK, man. Thank you, brother. Thank you very much. Going to get to your super chats in a little bit, guys, so uh, get them on in. You guys know the drill. We hang out later. We'll put them up. We'll throw them up on screen, and uh, we'll be going through them. So, again, ABK and Paul, too. Paul Hamilton, man. You guys are awesome. Thank you. There was no need to put the belt back on Austin Theory. That would have been completely foolish. I mean, I was rejoicing when they finally got the belt off this fucking guy because they've done such a poor job of doing anything with him since he beat John Cena at WrestleMania. So getting the title off of him was imperative. Putting it back on him would have been just completely stupid. Theory, you know, for his part, I mentioned that smooth transition when, when Ray came off with the splash, got the knees up, rolled into the next move. I mean, there were some things in this match. Theory looked pretty good. 
Theory's work looked good in the match. Ray had to win this. There was no question. Ray Mysterio had to win this match. They have not even gotten to the match yet between Ray and Escobar, and that's where this is going. I don't know how many of you saw SmackDown last night, but on SmackDown, they had a tag team match. It was Ray and it was Escobar taking on Theory and Waller, Grayson Waller. And it was Escobar who shoved Ray out of the way and took the bullet for his partner. But it cost them the match in the end. He got pinned by Grayson Waller. They have not at all showed Santos Escobar showing any sort of frustration or anger towards Rey Mysterio, but it's building. And it, it's going to continue to build until he explodes. And eventually we will get the match. The only question is, does it explode before they do the match? Or do they do the match first? Because you could have a friendly exhibition between these two guys. Have Ray put the title on the line? And it could be after that, where Escobar just snaps and goes heel and, and attacks Ray. Maybe they kick Ray out of the LWO. Uh, but we haven't even gotten to that point. They're not even teasing that yet, right? They're doing the slow burn. So this was the only outcome to this match. Backstage, Kathy Kelly was with Becky Lynch, asking Becky what is next for her now that uh, her feud with Trish is over with, thank the wrestling gods. Tiffany Stratton showed up. She said, look, we got off on the wrong foot. And she remembered uh, mistakenly listing Becky as a former NXT Women's Champion, which is what she did on the show last week. I think it was last week. She was rattling off the names of some of the former NXT Women's Champions. She mentioned Charlotte. She mentioned Beck, or not Becky, um, uh, Bailey, and then mentioned Becky. And the problem is Becky was never NXT Women's Champion. So I think that was a botch. I don't think that was intended. I mean, maybe it was, but I think they played it off well. Like, you know, they, they acknowledged in a promo later on in the show, she said, okay, I'm, my, my social media is blowing up with people telling me that Becky was never the NXT Women's Champion. So maybe it was intended, but it's been pretty clear they're building to something between Becky and Tiffany. And tonight they just kind of threw it in our face. So... Maybe that's what's next for Becky Lynch. Now that she's done with Trish and there's no obvious next opponent for her, unless they want to go right to her and, and Rhea Ripley, which I don't think they want to do that yet. Uh, I see that being the WrestleMania match. We could very well end up seeing Becky Lynch making an appearance in NXT. There's been a lot of main roster talent. Mustafa Ali, Baron Corbin, uh, other people have popped in and out of NXT. Seth Rollins defended the World Heavyweight Championship against Braun Breaker on NXT a few months ago. Sending Becky Lynch there would not be that much of a stretch. But then I don't know what you do, because would they put the NXT Women's Championship on Becky Lynch? Yeah, I mean, they could. Charlotte Flair held the NXT Women's Championship after she was already on the main roster for a few years. She beat Rhea Ripley for it at WrestleMania in the warehouse. Is that the next step for Becky Lynch? Will Becky Lynch win the title that she never won? It's possible. Then we had the best match on the entire card. The Steel City Street Fight. This was for the undisputed tag team titles. It was Kevin Owens and Sami Zayn taking on the Judgment Day, Finn Balor, and Damian Priest. This was the match coming into the show that I was most looking forward to, and it over-delivered. Quickly into the match. Sammy went for some chairs. Balor grabbed a kendo stick, and he also pulled out one of those yellow uh, towels. The yellow Pittsburgh Steelers, I guess they call them the terrible towels. Is that what they call them? Do I have that correct? The terrible, t is, is that to uh, describe uh, the city of Pittsburgh and their teams? I don't know. You guys will fill me in on that. So he pulls out a terrible towel. Everyone pops. And then he throws the towel on the floor. He begins to stomp on it. Of course, he got massive heat for it. Priest joined in, and uh, they started beating down Owens and Zane, or Owens, until Zane uh, hit a dive out over the top rope, took out Balor and Priest. Owens took off his shirt to reveal a Terry Funk t-shirt underneath. Zane and Owens then placed the garbage can over Balor's head, and they started whacking the garbage can with kendo sticks over and over again. It is. Okay, everyone Everyone is uh, telling me in the chat that uh, that is that is what it is. Well, we got a lot of uh, Pittsburgh Steeler haters in the chat. All right, so Priest, he brought his uh, 
Money in the Bank briefcase to the ring with him, just so you know, because it would play into the finish of the match. So uh, the briefcase was out there with them. But Zayn is uh, tossing chairs into the ring. Balor blasts Sammy with a kendo stick shot. We skip ahead a little bit here, because there was just so much back and forth with, with garbage can shots and kendo stick shots and chairs and tables would come into play. I don't want to go through... Uh, point by point every single thing here but Owens and Zane are battering these guys with uh trash cans then they pull a table out from under the ring which got the biggest pop of the match so far the predictable pop for the table they set the table up on the floor and the challengers threw Owens inside the ring they took turns jabbing at him with steel chairs Priest held Owens Balor slammed the trash can over his head the champions fought back. Priest and Balor, they tried to flee through the crowd. Owens and Zayn, they chased after them. And Dominic Mysterio showed up, and he helped out his uh, fellow Judgment Day members. So they got the champions down. They have control of the match. And the camera is focused, tightly focused on Balor and Priest, and Dom is there. And they're talking to each other, and they're kind of celebrating so something must be going on off camera, right? If they're keeping a tight shot of these guys. So finally, and we saw the reason why, because Owens and Zayn needed time to change into their new attire. See, we had a little wardrobe change here during the match. While that was going on, over in the penalty box here at the uh, PPG Paints Arena, Owens and Zayn changed into their Pittsburgh Penguins jerseys which they were wearing when the camera panned over to show them. They're in their jerseys. They got hockey sticks in their hand. Uh, they were wearing the Mario Lemieux and Sidney Crosby jerseys. Owens is also busted open. He is wearing the, uh, the proverbial crimson mask here. I didn't see how it happened. I didn't see there being any sort of spot where it would have happened a uh, hard way. I don't know if he bladed or not. If he bladed then I'm sure he would deny it, because blading is not allowed in WWE anymore. And it would have happened at a time when the camera wasn't on him. So, right, plausible deniability here. I just find it a little funny that on a night where they're having a match like this, and he is wearing a Terry Funk t-shirt, that Kevin Owens would come up a bloody mess. So, if he didn't blade, it was perfect timing. If he did blade, all he has to do is say that he did. <laughs> he can deny it. And say, oh, I tripped and fell. Yeah, I hit my head. I'm okay, you know. But it, again, in a match like this, that's what you expect to see. I don't know if I'm just so, so used to it from AEW, where they bleed every, you know, basically every show. Uh, it's a little jarring to see it in WWE because it's been a while. We don't really see that. You know, every now and then somebody will get it hard way. Brock did a few months ago in the match with Cody Rhodes, their first uh, match in Puerto Rico. Uh, but he's got the Terry Funk shirt on. He's standing there a bloody mess. So he looked great. So Dominic tried to take Owens hockey stick away from him. Zane and Owens, they threw down their gloves. They start pummeling him. Zane and Balor, they got back to the ring where there were just a pile of chairs. Zane landed a blue thunder bomb to Balor on the chairs for a near fall. Priest then set up some chairs next to each other. And he suplexed Sammy onto the open chairs. Back first. Priest got a two count out of that. Only because Owens, he couldn't make it in time. So he chucked a chair over at Priest. And it hit him to break up the fall. Action spilled outside again. Balor and Priest, they beat up Owens through the crowd. Sammy Zayn shows up. And the four of them, they end up fighting near where the pre-show. They had a pre-show set and a big uh, desk that they were broadcasting from during the uh, the pre-show. So Zayn stood on top of the desk, hit a somersault senton onto Balor and Priest. Dominic got involved again, and he put the boots to Sami Zayn. So Kevin Owens comes over, and Kevin Owens interrupts, and he sets up a table just underneath one of the entrance tunnels. And so you can, you can tell where this is going. You, you can tell what's about to happen here. He sets Dom up on the table. He starts climbing above the tunnel. So the fans are all there right by the, right the railing. He's climbing up over there. He's leaning on fans to try to keep his balance. And he hits a dive. Hits a, a senton 
off of, I guess, the balcony, if you want to call it that, nearly completely overshot Dominic. He, he's, he, he got enough of him to where he broke the table. It would have been very embarrassing if he didn't. But man, I just watched that and said, holy shit, he almost completely overshot his target on that one. And when he hit the ground, you could just hear this sickening thud. That was probably the man's tailbone as he hit the floor. This was the Jeff Hardy Royal Rumble 2000 spot from that very first tables match they ever did in WWE at Madison Square Garden. Same thing. Jeff Hardy standing above the little entranceway. I think it was Bubba on the table. Did the, uh, the swanton bomb through the table. So he did the Jeff Hardy spot, but man, you can hear that thud when he hit the floor. If he, he didn't break that tailbone, then he's a very lucky man. He may, he may have broken something else. I thought maybe he broke his leg. He was holding his leg. Back in the ring, Zayn and Balor, they were going at it. And Zayn went for the Huluva kick. Priest, though, threw a garbage can at his head. Zayn, though, fired up, and he hit an exploder to Priest. Zayn then knocked Balor off the apron, and Finn Balor took a just perfect bump off the apron through that table that was set up by the champs earlier on. So it was still sitting there the entire time. And Balor took this perfect bump. He just went right through it. Table broke in half. Zayn went for the Huluva kick. Priest, though, cut him off. Owens returned. He showed back up. He had a stunner on Priest, which I'm sure probably did not feel too good. Zayn finally hit the Huluva kick, and he had Priest dead to rights. But J.D. McDonough shows up, and he breaks up the fall. Pulls Zayn off of him. Owens slams McDonough onto the commentary desk with a pop-up powerbomb. The table did not break. He did not powerbomb him on top of the table. He actually took a, a far worse bump because he powerbombed him hard into the edge of the table. So maybe Owens didn't break his tailbone, but I wouldn't be shocked if J.D. McDonough didn't break his back on that spot. So he's wiped out now. He's down on the floor. Owens is starting to walk around the ring when all of a sudden Rhea Ripley appears and Rhea Ripley charges at Kevin Owens and spears him through the barricade right by the timekeeper's area. Now that is a spot that we have seen far too many times. It's, it's just, it's one of those spots that they really need to not retire, but really kind of tone down because I feel like we see it so many times. But just seeing Rhea Ripley spear Kevin Owens through the barricade uh, was something different, and it got a huge reaction. It was a great spot. Even though we've seen it a thousand times, it still got a great reaction. In the ring, Balor landed a sling blade on Zayn. He went to the top. Zayn moved out of the way when Balor went for the double stomp. Sammy hit an exploder and a haluva kick to Finn Balor. He went for the pin. But Dominic Mysterio reappears and he smacks Sami Zayn over the back of the head with the Money in the Bank briefcase that Priest brought to the ring with him. And Finn Balor then lifts his arm, he rolls over, drapes his arm over Sami Zayn, and he pins him to win the tag team titles for the Judgment Day 20 minutes into this Steel City street fight. And I just wrote, in my notes, all I wrote was, holy shit, what a match which is pretty much what I said on Twitter. What a fucking match this turned out to be. This will go down as one of the best WWE matches of the entire year. This was quality shit from these, again, I can't even say four people because Dominic played a role in this match. Rhea played a role, McDonough. Everybody had a part to play here in this match. And the story was, no matter what the judgment they threw at these two guys, they couldn't get the job done until finally it took all of them conspiring together to finally get these titles off of these men for the first time since WrestleMania. This right here, this was the Terry Funk tribute match that we got on SmackDown last week, the uh, Terry Funk hardcore match or whatever they called it. Yeah, not that. That's what this was. This is as close to a real hardcore match as you're going to get these days in WWE. Because this is the sort of thing here that when it clicks... There are some matches they'll do like this. Again, I'm, in a lot of ways, I'm kind of numb to, to matches like this because we, we do see them a lot these days, not so much in WWE. Um, but when you have a match like this with these four going in there as, as great as they are, and it just clicks, this was fantastic. This was all action. There was never a dull moment. 
fans loved it. Fans were reacting uh, big time to everything they were doing. So uh, this was this was great. As far as what's next now for Sammy and KO, I think some time off is probably due, especially for Kevin Owens. Uh, he may need a few weeks off when this match was over. I, I don't know. Beyond that, I don't know. Maybe a rematch. I guess we'll we'll have to see. I, I like legit. I would not be surprised if these men needed some time off, and you can't say they wouldn't deserve it. As far as Balor and Priest are concerned, the Judgment Day, they seem to be back on the same page again, at least for the time being. Uh, I'm sure that'll be short-lived. And now we'll see if Balor tries to convince the other members, if he tries to convince Priest and Rhea to allow J.D. McDonough to be part of the Judgment Day. Are they going to push back? Are they going to have an issue with that? Because McDonough, in the end, is going to lead to the downfall of this group one way or the other, at least in its current configuration. Probably it'll end up being Priest, who gets bounced from the group, eventually. Uh, I wouldn't do that anytime soon. But I think that's going to be the next story here, you know. He's been trying to prove himself. He's been trying to help. Right? He helped them. He helped tonight. Don't think that's not going to come up on TV Monday night, because Priest hasn't really been fond of this guy. And he'll say, look, the only reason you guys didn't lose and you didn't get pinned there was because of me. So now we get to see where they take this this story next going forward. But uh, this was the best match on the entire show. This was excellent stuff. Then we had the Grayson Waller effect with his special guest, the American Nightmare, Cody Rhodes. I will take a pause here just to uh, welcome everybody who is coming in. This is your uh, payback 2023 review. And uh, the goal tonight, the likes goal, is 500 to do our uh, Be the Booker segment a little bit later on. And uh, we are currently at 545, so we have already smashed the goal. Very good. Let's try for uh, 750. How about that? I think I, unders I undersold the goal. You, got, you guys overperformed, so let's shoot for 750. Waller said he wanted to uh, talk to Cody about his big announcement. He said that Cody has had so many ups and downs this year. He added that he appreciated Cody begging to be on his show tonight and uh, so that he can get the rub from Grayson Waller. Cody said that that was a fine little speech. He said that he knows Waller is a newly minted graduate from hip toss class. He thanked Waller for letting him on, and he said that he wants to give Waller a big scoop. And he asked Waller, do you watch Raw? And he asked him if he watches NXT, watches SmackDown. He said, SmackDown is intriguing. He said uh, he saw a wrong on that show recently that needs to be righted. So he cashed in whatever political chips he had, and he said that he hoped he knew what he was doing. And then he introduced all of us to the newest member, the Monday Night Raw roster, and he introduced... Main event, Jay Uso, who came to the ring to a remix version of the Uso's theme song. So see, Jimmy got new music on SmackDown last night, so now Jay has to get new music as well. Which sounds mostly like the old music, but it, it's a little bit different. So Cody left the ring. He stopped at ringside where he and Jay, they, they stared at one another for a few seconds. Cody left. Jay got into the ring. Cody had this look on his face like, I hope I didn't just make a mistake. Waller said that Jay has been a twin his entire life and he's been surrounded by the bloodline. He said that for as successful as he's been in a tag team, he's done absolutely nothing as a singles wrestler. And Waller started to say that if anybody is in need of the Waller rub, before he could finish his sentence, Jay gave him a super kick, took him out. And they showed Cody watching from the stage area while Jey Uso celebrated with the fans. Uh, an interesting development here in the story that I, uh, I was not expecting here. Jay did not stay gone for very long. What was he gone for? Two weeks, I think. I thought they would keep him out a little bit longer than that. I guess they couldn't help themselves. So now he's back on TV. But moving him to Raw, it gives them the separation that they're looking for because they want to hold off until WrestleMania. I don't believe we're getting Jimmy and Jay until WrestleMania. So if that's the goal, 
is to not do the first match before and then build to a kind of a big finale. They're going to just do the match at WrestleMania. There's a long time yet between now and then. So how do you keep this story interesting for those who were still interested in the story? Some people have already checked out. But how do you keep them separated? How do you, how do you keep this interesting? And this is their way of doing that to not even have them on the same show. It's, it's very similar to what WWE did with Rey Mysterio and Dominic going into WrestleMania this year. Rey Mysterio was going to quit in storyline. Remember Triple H confronted him backstage on one of the shows and said, before you make a, a, a rash decision here, I have a proposal for you. And the proposal ended up being that he traded or allowed Rey to go from Raw to SmackDown. Hey, Michael, thank you for uh, the $4.99 to choke out Jack Perry. That's one of our new Super Chats there. Thank you, Michael. So Ray went to a different show. He went to a different show to get away from his son. Now, of course, his son ended up just following him to that show. But for a while there, they had some separation because they did not want to do Ray against Dominic until they got to WrestleMania, which is exactly what they did. So they're following the same playbook here with Jimmy and Jay. Just move the guy to another show, and, and we'll try to kill some time until we get there. Um, the other thing also that it does here, it gives Raw another top babyface, which is what he'll be. I mean, look at the reaction he got when he came out in Pittsburgh today. Uh, he's out there. He's bouncing up and down. You know, everyone's cheering for Jay. Everyone loves Jay Uso. I look ahead to Survivor Series, and WWE has not said a word about war games. We don't know if they're even doing a war games match this year. I think they will. And as I look ahead to what that war games match could be, the obvious match would be the Judgment Day. Last year it was the Bloodline, okay? So this year it'll be the Judgment Day. Probably the Judgment Day against Cody Rhodes, Seth Rollins, Kevin Owens, and Sami Zayn. Well, that's four on four. Throw J.D. McDonough in there, and you get five. On the Judgment Day side, well, who's the fifth guy on the babyface side? Enter Jey Uso. That could very well be our War Games match this year. So they get another top babyface on Monday Night Raw, at least for the next few months, uh, which isn't a bad thing. But I here's what I think about this. Cody, I don't believe Cody is doing this out of the goodness of his heart, just because he's a swell guy. Cody is not doing this just to be a nice guy. I'm thinking that when we get a little bit closer to WrestleMania, Right, Cody said that he cashed in whatever political chips he had to make this happen. I think when we get a little bit closer to WrestleMania, if Cody does not win the Royal Rumble, let's say Gunther or someone else wins the Royal Rumble next year, and there goes Cody's opportunity right, to, to get Roman Reigns or WrestleMania. Because the Elimination Chamber every year is not always for a title shot at WrestleMania. I mean, look at the one this year. They did an Elimination Chamber for the U.S. title. So it's not a guarantee that Cody can just win the Elimination Chamber. Cody is going to uh, cash in on his return favor. And I think Jey Uso is probably going to uh, pay that favor back and get Cody Rhodes over to SmackDown. And that's how you get Cody on the other show. That's how you get Cody challenging Roman Reigns at WrestleMania for the championship next year. And nobody would love to stick it to Roman Reigns more than Jey Uso. That's my prediction. That's where I think this is going. There's a reason why Cody did what he did, not just because he's a nice guy. I think that's where that story is going. One other thing about this, and I I, I like Grayson Waller. You know, as a heel, he, he's kind of growing on me like a fungus. Uh, he posted a photo on social media after this segment, because he got super kicked in the face. Poor guy got kicked in the jaw by Jey Uso. And he posted this photo on Twitter earlier, trying to ice his jaw with a good old can of Pepsi. I mean, my God, it hasn't even been a full 24 hours yet. And already, Grayson Waller taking shots here with the, uh, with the Pepsi can. I did laugh at that. I know that's going to trigger some people, but I did laugh at that. I thought that was funny. I'm telling you, he's growing on me, this guy. We have the Women's World Championship on the line. It was Rhea Ripley going one-on-one -on -one with Raquel Rodriguez. I really liked their last woman standing match. 
match from NXT two years ago. That was the last match that Rhea Ripley had in NXT before she went to the main roster. I thought that was very good. So I had some, some hopes that they would be able to rekindle some of that magic from two years ago. Unfortunately, that did not happen here in this match. We had Rhea Ripley, Rhea Bloody Ripley, getting a bloody nose early on here in the match. Raquel hit a spinning corkscrew elbow from the second rope for a two count. Ripley came back. She went for Riptide, but Raquel worked out of it, went for a power bomb That did not work. And instead, Raquel hit a clothesline for a two count. Raquel placed Rhea on top of the uh, top turnbuckle and punched her off. Ripley, though, came back with a chop block to Raquel's bad knee, and she applied her prism lock submission. Raquel was able to counter that into an inside cradle for two. Raquel powered up Rhea, stumbled a little bit, and uh, looked like she botched whatever it was that she was trying for. The announce team uh, chalked it up to her injured knee, which was smart, because I think it was a botch, but... If you have somebody who is nursing an injury during the match, you can just chalk it up to the injury. See, it's just smart. Smart way to uh, handle it. So the match spilled outside. Raquel hoisted Rhea up. She ran her into the ring post, and then she flung her awkwardly into the barricade. She picked Rhea up again. She lawn darted her shoulder first into the post. Raquel brought Ripley back into the ring, and now here comes Dirty Dom. And Dominic comes back out yet again. He ends up getting brought into the ring, and uh, or entering the ring, but Raquel grabs a hold of him, gives him a power slam, lays out Dominic. From there, Ripley kicked the bad knee, and then she hit Raquel with Riptide for the win. If you watch this match, the work itself, I mean, it was solid. You know, the work was solid, but I don't, you know, as I look back on this match, it just didn't, it just didn't click. I didn't like this. I know that they have a better match in them, and we didn't get that match here on this show. Part of the problem is that Raquel is not over as a babyface. She's just not. She had the tag team with Liv Morgan there for a while. They were the women's tag team champions. She just has not gotten over yet in a real meaningful way. She hasn't made that connection as a babyface. Maybe she needs to be a heel. I, I don't know. Or they just have to work that much harder to try to get her over as a babyface. But there's no... There's no connection there. So the fans, they're not buying into her. They were silent for a pretty good portion of this match, which didn't help. And it went way too long. You know, Becky and Trish went out there in the opening match. They gave them 20 minutes. And I never once thought about the time. When the match is over, I said, wow, okay, they gave them 20 minutes. Because I was into the match all the way through. The people in the building were into the match all the way through. And it just, it clicked. It worked. And they had a great match. These two did not have a great match. It felt long, and it, and it was. I mean, they gave them almost as much time as Becky and Trish, and it felt like it. Dominic interfering, it gives Raquel a reason to want a rematch, because I assume this is the first of what will be multiple matches, these two women. This is not the end of the feud. So Dominic interfering now gives her an out to say, okay, you needed your little boyfriend there to cheat for you, but... You know, why don't you give me a, why don't you give me another shot and try that again, right? So this is going to continue. This is not the end of this here. But he had already interfered in the earlier match. So by this point now, he's coming back out again, interfering in another match. Uh, so that, I don't know, it just felt like, all right, this is something we've already seen here tonight. They did say on commentary, though, that Dominic was the MVP for the Judgment Day on this show because he helped them win the tag team titles. And then here he helped Rhea retain her women's championship. So I guess that's what they were going for. You know, they wanted him to play a role in both of these matches. So they told the story they wanted to tell. But again, as far as the uh, the match itself, it just... I, I know that these two have a better match in them because I've seen it before. Uh, you can't tell me in two years that, you know, some, something changed. And they, they can't go out there and, and have a great match. But... You know, I guess with, with the audience in NXT uh, back then, although when they had that last match, I'm trying to think if by that point they had any people in the Performance Center. Uh, or if it was just the Thunderdome screens. I don't remember at that point if they already had people back in there or not. Um, 
But we'll we'll see. They're gonna get another chance. Probably have another match at Fast Lane, maybe with a stipulation. And we'll see if they can uh do better. John Cena was in the back. And John Cena was playing his old Lance Catamaran character from Southpaw Regional Wrestling. He was in a suit. He had a bow tie on. I, I thought the funniest part of this was he had his wristbands over his suit sleeves. <laughs> he looked like just a complete geek standing there. I know, f far be it from, from you know me to sit here and call John Cena a geek, but that's what he was dressed up as. I'm sorry. That's what the fucking guy was here in this segment. Now, if you don't know what Southpaw Regional Wrestling is, if you've never heard of it before, you don't know who Lance Catamaran is, you think he's the local weatherman or something, you probably watched this and were thinking to yourself, why is John Cena dressed and acting like a geek here in this segment? He wanted to interview the Judgment Day. So they brought in Finn Balor and Damian Priest, and he was going to conduct the interview. He said, a lot, you know, my guest at this time, and he brought them in. And Balor used Cena's The Champs Are Here line. Priest said that when they're on the same page, nobody can stop them. And then when the segment was over, he looked over at Cena and said, good job, kid. And Cena acted all uh, happy and proud. You know, I guess when John Cena came back, I guess that uh, when he said that he wanted to come back and work, you know, he, he's going to have him doing all the jobs. He's been a referee. He's been a host. He's been a backstage announcer. Now he has to take Stu's job. Stu the cameraman. He can be the cameraman. He can be an he can be an announcer. He can do some announcing on commentary for some of the shows. They can have him doing all kinds of jobs here because they have the uh, the writer strike and the actor strike is ongoing, and so he's you know just trying to kill time. He needs things to do. Oh yeah, somebody mentioned that. that's a good point actually. I I thought to myself as I'm watching this, I go, did Cena shrink? <laughs> he looks awfully short. He was probably crouching, which is what some of the announcers do. So they don't look as tall as the wrestlers. They have them crouching. He probably was. He probably was crouching. That's a good point. I just thought, you know, he's getting older. That's what happens when you get older. You get shorter. But he was probably crouching down. And with no Roman Reigns on the show, and I don't know if Issa is here with us. I'm sure she was devastated by that. No Roman Reigns. No Tribal Chief here on this show. That paved the way for Seth Rollins to have the main event all to himself, which doesn't happen very often, but we got the World Heavyweight Championship. We got the secondary title defended here in the main event of the show against Shinsuke Nakamura. The champion entered first, which I hate, but they sent him out to the ring first because they had a special video that they wanted to play after Rollins came out. Special video here for Nakamura. And it actually was a very cool video. It was a an anime intro video. So it was the series of animations, almost like out of a comic book. It showed Nakamura. It showed Rollins. It was narrated in Japanese by Nakamura before he made his actual entrance. And it was focusing on Seth's bad lower back and uh, Nakamura telling us that he would unburden him by taking the world championship away from him. So then... They show at ringside the great Muda. They actually flew Muda in for the show. He was their invited guest in the first row. The announcers made mention of the fact that Nakamura wrestled him earlier this year. It was actually New Year's Day. It was on the Pro Wrestling Noah show. They had that match. So I, I was actually surprised because I thought at some point maybe the action would spill outside. We would see Muda stand up and like mist. Rollins in the face or something. He didn't do anything. He just sat there and I wonder if did, now was he at Starcast this weekend? He couldn't be, right? Because Starcast is in Chicago. I think he flew directly into Pittsburgh. So I don't know. I mean, is Muda going to be in Chicago tomorrow for Starcast? I wonder. Or maybe they just flew him in for this. So the crowd had dueling chance. Nakamura rolled to the outside, and uh, Rollins followed with a tope. A few minutes later, Nakamura was on top of the announce table, and he lured Rollins in. Ultimately, though, Nakamura, he threw Seth pretty hard on top of the table, and Rollins landed very awkwardly on his back, the bad back. Nakamura then worked a camel clutch in the ring. He hit a backbreaker and then landed a running knee to Rollins' head. He worked a single-leg crab. Rollins was able to kick his way out of it, though. 
And Nakamura went to the second rope. Rollins cut him off with a series of chops. Seth landed a Frankensteiner from the top rope, which is not a smart thing to be doing if you're selling a bad back. I would not be jumping off the top rope and landing on my neck, landing on my back. But that's what he did. He took him over with the uh, Hurricane Rana. Two of them got to their feet. They start trading elbows. Rollins got the better of it, hit a clothesline and a sling blade. Rollins then hit a super high frog splash, very uh, Montez Ford-esque frog splash. He got some good height on this one. Only got a near fall out of it. He went to go try lifting Nakamura, but he hurt his back. So then Rollins decided to try for the stomp. And Nakamura moved, hit a knee from the second rope for a two count. Shinsuke came back with a rolling snap German suplex. And then he uh, landed an exploder. He charged at Rollins. Seth countered with a super kick, hit a few strikes. Nakamura rolled into an arm bar, but Seth powered him up, lifted Nakamura for a sit-out powerbomb. So the two of them, they stand up together. It's like a war of attrition here. They stand up together. They're trading elbows. Nakamura lifts Rollins. Rollins, though, works out of it, hits an enziguri. Seth goes to the top. Shinsuke cuts him off, and Nakamura hits uh, basically an F5 from the middle rope. Got a good near fall out of that. Rollins eventually hit a pedigree, went for the stomp. Nakamura cut him off. And it wasn't long after that that Rollins did finally connect with the stomp. It only took one, and he covered Nakamura, and he pinned him. And Nakamura had the little leg kick going. Mick Foley used to do that. Mick Foley did that actually in the, uh, the Hell in a Cell match he had with The Undertaker after all the punishment. And all the abuse that he took, took that tombstone, he still had to give that little leg kick at the end just to show that he had some life left in him. But he pinned Nakamura to retain the championship, and the show ended with Seth in the ring. And again, he's he's down on his knees, referee's asking him if he's okay, and he's he's sort of nursing the bad back and saying, yeah, yeah, I'm okay. And you could see Nakamura outside the ring, he immediately rolled out of the ring. And he was like pacing back and forth, upset that he lost the match. You could see him in the background. He was looking at Seth. He was outside. And I thought, okay, maybe he's going to come back in. He's going to give him a, a Kinshasa to the back of the head or something. That didn't happen. And not only did that not happen, I was waiting for Damian Priest to come out. Because Rollins was really selling the back, right? He won the match, but at what cost, right? He had cuts all over his back. He's holding his lower back. And they lingered for a while. They, they were lingering in a way that made you think that something was about to happen, either with Priest coming out or Nakamura coming back in. I mean, fuck, you had Muda sitting at ringside. Like, what are they going to do here? Right? They're not just going to go off the air like this. And so some time passes by, and that's exactly what happens. They cut to a highlights package for the show, and that was it. And I thought to myself... Given the fact that this guy is selling his back so much, and he's in such a bad way, and I understand that Damian Priest had a pretty exhausting match himself earlier on. It's not like he's fresh as a daisy. But Seth Rollins is in a pretty bad way here. Storyline-wise, put yourself in kayfabe mode for a second. Why would Damian Priest not come out and try to cash in his money in the bank? He's gloating in the back during that promo with uh, Lance Catamaran about how the Judgment Day has all the gold, right? We have the tag team titles. I have money in the bank. Rhea is the women's champion. Dominic is the North American champion. I mean, shit. It would have been quite fitting for him to come out and try to cash in money in the bank and win the World Heavyweight title, too. So storyline-wise, it didn't make a whole lot of sense uh, for him not to come out and try to cash in his money in the bank. So I thought it was actually a very weird ending to the show. Um, they did tell a story with Seth's back. That was the big focus of them. That was the big focus going into the match. And I never thought, at no point during this match, and at no point during the build-up to this match, did I ever think that Nakamura had a prayer of walking out of this match as the World Heavyweight Champion. I just didn't buy into it. And I know his background, and there was a lot of fanfare around him when he came into the company many years ago. And I was there in Dallas for his NXT debut against Sami Zayn, and, and everyone was buzzing about Shinsuke Nakamura after the career that he had and the success that he had in New Japan. 
And I can't say that he hasn't had a successful career in WWE because he's won championships and he's still with the company after all these years and probably making a very good living. And, you know, if you wanted to go back to Japan, he wouldn't be back in Japan. He obviously enjoys it here. So he's living the life that he wants to live and he must be happy with the way things are. But you still have these people who think that one of these days we're going to get the old Shinsuke Nakamura back. And the more that I have watched him over the years, I just watch it and I think to myself, did it ever occur to these people that maybe he does not want to go back to that version of Shinsuke Nakamura? He worked a very hard style. He worked strong style. And I'm sure his body took a lot of abuse in those years. And so maybe there's a reason why he doesn't want to go back to that. <laughs> maybe that's why he's content just kind of doing what he's doing. That version of Nakamura, you're never going to get that in WWE. And so you're never going to get Nakamura pushed at a, at a top level as a world champion. That time has come and gone. So the people asking, well, what's next for Shinsuke? What's next for Shinsuke is nothing. What's next for Shinsuke is maybe a rematch at Fastlane. They could run this back one more time. I don't see the purpose. He got beat clean. And he didn't do anything when the match was over. He didn't beat up Seth again. They didn't do some sort of big injury angle. So, yeah, sure, he, he might get one more match out of it, but I don't really see the point. They did the match. It was for one purpose. That was the only purpose. The Nakamura served a purpose here, which was, we need somebody that Seth Rollins can beat. We need somebody that Seth Rollins can work with. He served that purpose, and now he lost, and he goes to the back of the line. If he's lucky, he'll get one more match out of it. But that's it. Back to the mid card. I don't know. These people who have this idea in their head that, you know, this is some renewed push where Nakamura is going to be back to the top of the card. This is why it looked like he got that kind of renewed push when they moved him over to Monday Night Raw. It was to get him to this spot. Nothing more, nothing less. The anime video was actually pretty cool. Uh, it reminded me of those videos we got for Zia Lee. And then after a couple of appearances, we never saw her again. So much for that. But as far as um, the World Heavyweight Championship is concerned, look, the minute that Gunther loses the Intercontinental title, you can start the countdown clock. Because that title is coming to him. I think it happens at WrestleMania. It could happen sooner than that. So what's next for Seth Rollins Once the if, if this is it for Nakamura? In the short term, I don't know who the next person would be. But I know who is coming for that title. I know exactly who's coming for that title or who should be coming for that title. I just think it's a little premature. I think you got to you got to wait a little bit before you do Gunther and Seth Rollins cuz I think he's the one to take that title away from him. Let's see what you guys thought of Payback tonight. 73% thumbs up, 17% thumbs in the middle and 9.6% thumbs down. I wouldn't call that a thumbs down shot. I, I think that's being too hard on it. I think th thumbs in the middle, I could I could see. I would go thumbs up, but I wouldn't say you're crazy if you said thumbs in the middle. I can see people looking at some of the key matches on this show as being a little slow. I'd give it a uh, a solid thumbs up if if maybe uh, in that kind of I don't know six and a half seven range somewhere in there. But the two outstanding matches on the show, I thought, really over-delivered. So I, uh, I did enjoy those matches very much. Hey, Merlot. Merlot Williams coming in with a uh, $5 super chat. Hey, Merlot, thank you, brother. I appreciate that. Let me uh, mention one other thing here before I get to what I want to get to next. And uh, this is pretty cool. So I, I do want to I do want to uh, show you something that Albert sent to me a little bit earlier on. This is uh, from GalaxyCon earlier today in Austin, Texas. Albert attended GalaxyCon. He got to meet the Nature Boy, Ric Flair, and he is sporting our Rumble like it's 1992 shirt from our store on Pro Wrestling Tees. There is a Labor Day sale going on right now. It is over as of 1 o'clock on Monday. 
And uh, you can get 20% off any shirt in our store. All you got to do is go to ProWrestlingTees.com slash off. And there must be, I don't know, 30 shirts in there, something like that. That's one of them. There's uh, lots of other ones. So if you want that discount, go ahead and take advantage of it sometime between now and Monday. And uh, you too can rumble like it's 1992. I said to him, I said, that's just, it's perfect. <laughs> just Flair being there pointing. It looks like he's pointing at the shirt. Like it's just the perfect photo. So whatever you guys get a shot like that, send it to me and I'll give you a shout out because that's, that's just too perfect. So, uh, Albert, thank you very much, man. I appreciate that. Now, let me talk about something else here before I get into your Super Chats. Because I did say at the top of the stream that today was a very newsworthy day in the world of pro wrestling. And I knew it would be because of payback. But, of course, Tony Khan goes ahead and has to make the announcement today. He should have made it tomorrow. Would have made more sense. But he went and made the announcement today that CM Punk, Phil Brooks, has been terminated from All Elite Wrestling. And there are people who are very upset about this. There are other people who are celebrating, like it's some big holiday or something. To me, when I heard the news, I was more sad and disappointed than anything else. My first thought though, which is what I said online was, it was a move that had to be made. It's a move that comes one year too late, but it was a move that had to be made. Tony Khan finally had a spine when it came to CM Punk and he did the right thing. It was the decision that made the most sense. This is the announcement that went up earlier today from All Elite Wrestling. And Tony Khan saying, All Elite Wrestling has terminated the wrestler and employment agreements between Philip Brooks, CM Punk, and AEW with cause. Effective immediately. The termination was confirmed today by Tony Khan, CEO, general manager, and head of creative of AEW. The termination follows a week-long internal investigation of an incident occurring backstage at AEW. In London on Sunday, August 27th. Following the investigation, the AEW Discipline Committee met and later convened with outside legal counsel before making a unanimous recommendation to Tony Khan that CM Punk must, or not must, I'm throwing that in there, that CM Punk be terminated with cause. Khan offered the following statement, Phil played an important role within AEW and I thank him for his contributions. The termination of his AEW contracts with cause is ultimately my decision and mine alone. Of course, I wish I had not, uh, I wish I did not have to share this news, which may come as a disappointment to many of our fans. Nevertheless, I am making the decision in the best interest of the many wrestling, of the many people. Man, I'm staring at, the, I'm staring at the live chat. I'm going back and forth. I got to focus on this. The best interests of the many amazing people who make AEW possible every week. Our talent, staff, venue operators, and many others whose efforts are unsung but essential to bringing our fans great shows on television and at arenas and stadiums throughout the world. I was curious if they would say anything about this at the top of the show tonight on Collision. So when Payback went on the air, I also had Collision on, on a separate screen. And Collision opened with a pre-taped backstage segment from Tony Khan. And Tony Khan actually addressed the situation. Now, keep in mind, they were at the United Center tonight. They were in Chicago for Collision. And they're going to be back uh, at the United Center tomorrow night for All Out. So the timing could not be any worse for Tony Khan. Because when he booked these shows months ago, he booked them with the idea that CM Punk would be his star attraction being in Chicago, that he was going to be part of these shows. And so not only was he not part of these shows, but he has to go out there and he has to make this announcement. Now, he came out with a statement tonight. This is what he said. He said, today I had to make one of the toughest decisions of my professional career. Today I terminated Phil Brooks, CM Punk, for cause. This stems from a backstage incident at All In last Sunday. The incident was regrettable, and it endangered people backstage. 
That includes the production staff, the people who help put the show on every week, innocent people who had nothing to do with it. I've been going to wrestling shows for over 30 years. I've been producing them on this network for nearly four years. Never in all that time have I ever felt, until last Sunday, that my security, my safety, my life was in danger at a wrestling show. I don't think anybody should feel that way at work. I don't think the people I work with should feel that way. And I had to make a very difficult choice. Today came at the recommendation of a discipline committee here in AEW, as well as outside legal counsel who delivered a unanimous recommendation. And I have followed up on that recommendation. I am sorry to any fans who were upset by this. I am sorry to anyone who was upset uh, by the news. Despite that, we are going to have a great show tonight on Collision, and we're going to have a great AEW All Out pay-per-view tomorrow here in Chicago. Last weekend was the greatest weekend in AEW history. This is the greatest week in AEW history. We are going to continue the great momentum here tonight on Collision and tomorrow night on All Out on pay-per-view. So that was quite the statement for the owner of the company to go out on live television and to dress down the man that had basically been his biggest star attraction by not only saying that he had terminated him, but by saying that he endangered the safety, security, and the lives of people backstage at all in last weekend. And that sounds very over the top, but Tony Khan had a front row seat for what happened with CM Punk and Jack Perry at all in last Sunday. Because there have been a lot of different versions of that story that have gone around. There's one version of the story, I know Meltzer shared it in the, in the Observer, and as soon as people hear the name Meltzer, they're going to immediately dismiss it. But there was one neutral party who was not a wrestler, who witnessed the entire thing, who said that CM Punk was the aggressor. And that when we had heard that Tony Khan was right there, and that you know monitors fell over either by him or, or on him, CM Punk lunged. Tony Khan had to be restrained. Samoa Joe was nearby. He was very upset. He tried to calm down Punk and tried to defuse the situation. If that is true, and I believe that it probably is, I don't think Tony Khan makes this decision unless it escalates to that point where CM Punk either tries to attack him or cusses him out, yells at him. We heard that too, that he had some harsh language. He had some harsh words for Tony Khan. There is no bigger CM Punk fan than Tony Khan. Tony Khan wanted him to be in this company from day one. And when Tony Khan got CM Punk in AEW, there was probably no bigger cheerleader than him. We heard when Punk came back at Collision in June on that debut episode. He was right there by the gorilla position on headset going, CM Punk, chanting for him like he was one of his fans in the crowd. There is no bigger cheerleader for CM Punk than Tony Khan. For him to take the decision that he did, take it all the way to where he did today, that resulted in termination from the company, letting him go in the way that he did, you know that this had to escalate to a point where it crossed the line. These are things that apparently people think just because you're a, a top star, you're a big name, are acceptable. I've been getting messages after message after message after message from people. Tony Khan would be a fool to let go of CM Punk and do what you suggest that he do. You're a clown. CM Punk is the top draw in the company. He's the top merch seller, which he was even as, as late as this past week. CM Punk was the top merch seller in the entire company, which is why I have a lot of respect for Tony Khan putting his foot down and doing what he did, despite all of those things, despite how big of a star this guy is. He knows it's going to hurt the company in the short term. They're going to take a short-term hit, whether it's merch, whether it's ticket sales, collision ratings. It's going to have an impact. But in the end, AEW will be better off for it. AEW will survive. AEW is not going to wilt and die. There was an AEW before CM Punk. There will be an AEW after CM Punk. If that means they take a short-term hit and they have to find other ways to try to boost those numbers up to where they were before, then that's what they'll do. People talking about Collision as if, you know, CM Punk was, was popping million, million ratings on uh, fucking TNT every weekend. Collision ratings were good for what TNT probably expected on a Saturday night. 
But there are some people who are way overplaying things, and CM Punk wasn't even really that much of a featured part of the show the last two or three weeks. It was almost like the last few weeks he was almost being phased out in a way. And Collision was still a very good show. If they continue the philosophy that they've had with Collision, which is slow the pace down from what they do on Dynamite, let the, let the action breathe a little bit more, feature some really great wrestling matches and stories, as far as the quality of the show, Collision will be just fine. I can't speak to the ratings. I don't know. Look, they're heading into college football season now. Collision is going to get creamed by sports. That was going to happen with or without CM Punk. So keep that in mind. If the collision numbers suddenly take a nosedive, they're going into a, a fall season now where they're going to be up against a lot of stiff competition. They were going to get shellacked no matter what. But for Tony Khan to take this step, I think speaks volumes about what he must have seen. He was there. He witnessed the entire incident. And supposedly there's video footage because Wembley Stadium has cameras all over the place. It's probably on, on film. I would love for TMZ to get that footage and leak that. He was right there. They can do all the investigating they want to. Tony Khan witnessed the entire thing. So if CM Punk was the, ing was the aggressor here and he instigated physicality, we know what Jungle Boy did. We know what Jack Perry did on the pay-per-view. He made the comment that he made. That does not give CM Punk the right to confront him and then start shoving him or slapping him or pie-facing him in the back, unless Jack put his hands on him first, which by a lot of the accounts, that did not happen. Even Sean Ross Sapp of Fightful said, to a T, everybody they heard from said Jack Perry 100% did not throw the first punch or the first shot. And this is not the first time that something like this has happened. This is what people didn't understand last year when I said that Tony Khan needs to part ways with CM Punk. And they said I was crazy then. Here we are a year later now. It is officially 1.30 in the morning as I am sitting here talking about this. It is now Sunday, September 3rd. Do you know what today is? Today is one year to the day of Brawl Out. It was the Sunday before Labor Day 2022. It is now the Sunday before Labor Day 2023. And here we are. One year to the day after Brawl Out, CM Punk is gone. He is terminated from AEW. It should have happened last year. It didn't. Now, Tony Khan probably got himself a brand new television show because he brought CM Punk back. No doubt. He had a lot to do with, with Collision getting on the air. I, I, don't, I don't doubt that. But here we are now a year later, and he has to go out there on his television show and talk about how he feared for his life. I mean, that's pathetic that it's even gotten to this point. That he would be that angry that Tony Khan actually felt that his life was in jeopardy. And that the safety of the people that were around that area there, those people's safety was were potentially in jeopardy if he was so unhinged. And they had a, an outside firm investigating this. What did they find? What do you think they found? It took Tony this long to make the call. There had to be some damning evidence. So CM Punk came into AEW a hero. He came in, he had this grand return, man. It was, it was an amazing moment when he walked out there in the United Center. One of the loudest ovations that I have ever seen in wrestling history. When they hit his music, and for the first time in seven years, he was back on television with a major promotion. And you thought, man, this is the start of a, of a new chapter for this company. They got him. They actually brought CM Punk back to wrestling. And now look at all these different people that he can work with. We can get CM Punk against Brian Danielson and CM Punk against Kenny Omega and CM Punk against all these different people. MJF. And we got the MJF feud was fantastic. The match, you know, the dog collar match at Revolution, the whole story, the promos back and forth with Punk and MJF. One thing I'm grateful for is that we got that. Because there were a lot of other people we didn't get to see Punk work with. And it looked like this is going to, you know, be sort of the turning point in many ways for AEW. Business-wise, right? They popped their first million-dollar buy rate. There were a lot of, of business firsts with CM Punk on the roster. There was a lot of positive that came out of that for a while. But it just got to a point after Brawl Out where it was so toxic. 
that there was no coming back from this. If Tony Khan couldn't get them in a room together to try to settle things, and he decided we're going to have, we're effectively going to cut the roster almost in half, and we're going to kind of separate everybody because they don't get along or they don't want to work together, that right there was the first sign that this was never going to work. This was a toxic situation that was never going to work. And now you look at, you know, him flying off the handle here. And you know what? I can kind of understand why the Bucks didn't want to have anything to do with him. I still say that the Bucks had a responsibility as EVPs in the company to at least sit down and hear what the man had to say. If only to just try to, you know, put things behind them and, okay, you don't have to work together, but at least hear him out and let things cool down enough that you guys can coexist in the same locker room. Because I feel like if you're going to be executive vice presidents in the company, you at least have a responsibility to do that. You can't just worry about yourself as talent. You are now executives in this company. You have to look out for what's best for AEW. And I, I still feel that way. They chose not to. They didn't want to have anything to do with this guy. You know what? I'm starting to see why. Jack Perry makes a comment into the camera. You may think it was completely unnecessary. It was inflammatory. Why would he make that comment? Do I think he should be punished for that? Sure. Do I think he should have been fired? No. That's the other thing I'm getting. Well, how, Tony Khan now has to fire Jack Perry. No, he doesn't. No, he doesn't. There's no history of Jack Perry fighting other people backstage. There's no history of Jack Perry going out in a media scrum and embarrassing his boss in front of the world and talking about the EVPs, they can't run a target and fuck this guy and fuck that guy and having a complete meltdown or having brawls in the back with other people. If there was, I'd say, sure, get rid of him. This was not the first offense for CM Punk, though. And CM Punk is someone who should know better. CM Punk is so he's a veteran. He's talked about how I'm trying to run a business here. That's how you run a business? Really? That's how you run a business? He did it to himself. And that's the saddest part of all. He had a lot to contribute to this company. He had a sweet gig. He was getting paid well. Apparently, he had multiple contracts. He had some sort of employment contract and a talent contract. I'd love to, I'd love to know more about that. Probably had a sweet deal. They, put, they gave him his own show. He got to basically pick who's allowed on the show and who's banned from the show. Banning the head of talent relations from the company for even coming to the building is ridiculous. And that's on Tony Khan for even allowing that shit. But he gets to work with his friends, FTR, and work with other people like Ricky Starks and Bullet Club Gold and the House of Black. He had a good thing going there. But the problem with CM Punk that I have noticed is for all the talk about people being soft, the softest one of all is CM Punk. Because the slightest comment just sets him off I mean it, it is just ridiculous that he is so triggered by these comments from someone like Jungle Boy for this to happen for him to allow something like this to happen instead of saying when Jungle Boy comes back and he really has a problem with him leave it alone go out there have your match with Samoa Joe come to the back go find Jungle Boy and say hey can I talk to you for a second what was that comment out there and have a conversation with him and let him know, you know what? That's not cool. That's disrespectful. If you have an issue with me, come to me. We'll talk about it. Doesn't have to be a personal thing. No, he has this bravado about him where he has to, it's almost like he, it's like a dick measuring contest. I mean, that's fine if, if you want to be some young punk who wants to act like that. But again, he should know better. Trying to conduct business, that's not how you conduct business. And also, there's a time and a place for it. Backstage at the gorilla position in front of your fucking boss at Wembley Stadium on the biggest night in the history of this company to blow up in that way is embarrassing. It happened before, it happened again, and I guarantee you that if he would have stuck around, it would have happened again at some point. Somebody would have made a little comment, he's got that hair trigger, and it would have happened, and there would have been a third investigation. How long does that go on for? before Tony Khan says enough is enough. We cannot continue to do this in this company. We are a laughing stock. We can't allow this to continue to happen. This was inevitable. CM Punk was not going to 
survive in that environment in AEW. If he flies off the handle that easily, and he does not like the people that he works with, if he thinks they're children, if he thinks that there's there's working with a bunch of fucking morons, if that's how he feels, or he feels he can't trust these people, which is what he has said before, if there's no trust, then that's just not going to be a work environment that is sustainable. Then you can't work with these people. It's just not going to work. So the best thing to do is to shake hands and say, thank you very much, good luck, but this isn't going to work anymore. That's what Tony Khan did today. He made the decision that he had to make, and it was not an easy one, but I respect him for finally doing it, even though I think it was a year too late. And where this goes from here, I mean, we're going to have to wait and see, because they threw those words with cause around a lot in those statements, and that's for a reason. They wanted to make it very clear that they feel they have the legal standing, I guess, and they have the justification for doing this. It might have to do with them not wanting to pay him on whatever money is left that's owed to him. There could be lawsuits that come out of this. In fact, it's probably very likely that there may be a lawsuit or two uh, that comes out of this. I don't know what this means as far as his, if there is some sort of non-compete or some sort of stipulation that would bar him from immediately going to work somewhere else. It could be a situation where they don't pay him whatever money is owed to him, but he's still bound and not allowed to go work somewhere else. I mean, I don't know. It could get very, very messy. I'm sure this is the last thing that Tony Khan wanted, was to be in this kind of a situation here, but here we are, and we're going to have to wait and see how this plays out. We have not heard anything yet from Punk's side, I don't believe. But I'll tell you one thing, boy, Boy, did Edge's value go up. If Edge has not yet made a decision on what he wants to do, boy, did his value to Tony Khan just shoot way up. I'll tell you that much. He, he's in a prime position right now. I don't know. He said he had some sort of a, a renewal in his in his inbox from WWE waiting for him. Uh, after the events of today, I, I would, if I were him, I would hold off on signing that extension. Let WWE go back to the table and come back at you with a different offer. Because I'm sure he could fetch quite a bit more money after the uh, the events of today. What this means for the future of CM Punk, I don't know. WWE. People asking me, do I think he's going to go to WWE? Do I think he would want to go to WWE? Probably, yeah. He popped in there backstage at Monday Night Raw a few months ago. He wanted to have a conversation with Triple H. He got turned away from the building. He got to talk to The Miz and a few other people. He never did get more than a couple of minutes with Triple H. What he wanted to talk to him about, I don't know. But do I think that he would be open to the idea of going back there? Yeah, I do. I think he would. I don't know that he's ready to just retire and hang it up, or he's going to be content to just work the odd indie show from here on out. I don't think they can afford him. He might pop up here and there at different events, but as far as CM Punk on the national stage, it's really WWE or bust. That's really all, the only realistic option he has left. And I know that Survivor Series is coming up in Chicago in November. They got the Royal Rumble not long after that. WrestleMania 40 is coming up, right? It's just this period where if he was to come into WWE... He would make a huge splash. There's no doubt about that he would make a huge splash. I look at this and I say, what company would want to work with this guy after this? For for Tony Khan to do what he did, it's the last thing in the world that he wanted to do. For him to do that, it had to be really bad. Who in their right mind would want to work with this guy after what happened here? I understand the business implications of it, but I'm just saying as far as kind of rolling a a live grenade into your locker room, because you got to remember something here. Vince McMahon does not like CM Punk. Triple H probably does not like CM Punk still. Seth Rollins doesn't like CM Punk. Kevin Owens in the past I know has had issues with CM Punk. You can look up the uh, the, the T-shirt story, the the whole... uh, T-shirt incident from Ring of Honor many years ago, if you never heard that story before. Uh, He doesn't have that many friends in that locker room. I don't think he would be welcomed back with open arms 
but it is not out of the realm of possibility that he could be welcomed back. I just don't know how realistic that is. But there's something else to keep in mind here. I mentioned earlier that later this month, the Endeavor deal is expected to finalize and close, and it'll be official. That uh, WWE, UFC, the merger under Endeavor. We're entering a whole new world here. Because for the first time, WWE will no longer be under the control of the McMahon family. They'll still be involved, Vince McMahon will still be involved, but it will no longer be his. It will no longer be under their, you know, mostly their control. So we don't know what Endeavor would think of this entire situation. It's entirely possible that Endeavor would say, hey, we want to do business with, with CM Punk, right? He's big business. Sure, we'd love to bring him into WWE. Go ahead, have a conversation with him. Let's see if we can work something out. So. In the next few weeks, it may not be their decision to make, whether you know, Triple H or Vince McMahon and Nick Khan, it may not ultimately be their decision to make. So we are entering just kind of uh, uncharted waters here. But I just think back to the comments that Punk has made just in the last couple of years about WWE. You know, when Sasha and Naomi walked out, he was very vocal about, I'm not even saying he's wrong, uh, or I disagree with some of the opinions and things he said about WWE. But for him to turn around then and, and want to work for the company after the comments he made, after Sasha and Naomi walked out about uh, when, when they went on television and said, you, you know, they disappointed the WWE universe. They had Michael Cole make that statement on TV. And, you know, he was asked about that. And he said, oh, they did the same thing, you know, to me. And, and there are a bunch of bootlickers there and cowards. And he made other comments about how, why would I go back there? Because... You know, I, I, I don't want to go back there and feel like I'm just sort of another guy on the roster doing terrible television. And then he made that crack when he was feuding with MJF about WrestleMania being a two-for-one extravaganza. I mean, he's, he's pulled no punches in the comments he's made about this company. You have to imagine that there are a lot of people who work there who have very long memories. These are not people who have short memories. And so I would not say that, oh, it's, you know, WWE, of course they're going to want to bring in CM Punk. Imagine him coming out as number 30 in the Royal Rumble or something. Sure, yeah, that would be a huge moment. But he's made a lot of comments and burned a lot of bridges in his day. And not only in AEW and WWE, but even other promotions where he worked prior to that. There's a lot of people that he hasn't gotten along with over the years. He's a thorny guy. And that could come back to bite him if he wants to go work there. But again, with the Endeavor stuff, we'll just have to wait and see how that plays out. Because I don't know. I don't know ultimately how this story is going to end for him. It's a sad end, though, as far as AEW is concerned. It's a very sad end for somebody who brought so much hope and promise and excitement um, and seemed genuinely happy to be there. He did. He seemed genuinely happy to be there. I wish I could buy you all ice cream. Right? We all remember those early promos. And CM Punk is still one of the best promo guys in the business. Uh, he has a lot of fans out there who are still very attached to him and believe in him and want to see you know, him wrestle all these different people and they'll follow him to the ends of the earth. But he made it very difficult on himself. And you can talk about the elite and you can talk about Jack Perry. There are no totally innocent parties in this situation here. Tony Khan also. There are no innocent parties in this. But there's a way to conduct yourself, and there's a way that you don't conduct yourself. He, of all people, should know better than 20-something-year-old Jack Perry making a comment and acting like a punk. This is a guy who is, what is he, 40, almost 45 years old. Talks about, you know, I'm old and I'm, I'm around children, and acts like the biggest child of all. So this is a mess of his own making. He has nobody to blame for this but himself. You always have control over these external factors and how you react to them. He reacted poorly to them. He got away with it the first time. I wouldn't have even let him get away with it the first time. Tony Khan let him get away with it the first time. He got off easy there. He brought him back. You burn him a second time, that's it. That's it. And you do it in front of your ball. That's the thing I can't really get over here is that he just goes and does that right in front of Tony Khan because he probably felt like, well, what's Tony going to do to me? <laughs> you 
Maybe he felt bulletproof. I don't know. After Tony brought him back, but he found out the uh, the hard way that that is not the case, and so his run in AEW ends in disgrace. Started out so promising, and it just goes down in flames. And uh, you know, when you look back on Punk and his legacy, this is now part of his legacy. This is a stain on his legacy. This is not something that people are just going to gloss over and forget about. This could very well be his end, you know, in the wrestling business on a, on a national stage. And for it to end the way that it did, I don't celebrate that. I'm not happy about that. I was never happy about any of this. I thought this was all very embarrassing for everybody involved. It never should have happened in the first place. But Tony Khan did what he had to do. He made the right decision. Despite all the punk fans who will disagree, because they like the guy, it's not a crime to like CM Punk, but he made the right decision. Let's go to your uh, super chats here, see what you guys have to say about all this and this show. There's more details as well, more things I want to say about this that uh, I will save for tomorrow on the podcast and we got to talk about all out tomorrow as well i'll have uh, all out predictions so just a very sad situation all around hey tuxedo thank you man ironically he says it is now cm punk who is banned from collision collision dynamite rampage every show He's banned from every show. Naughty Dill. And by the way, I heard that at the end of Collision tonight, I guess the Young Bucks appeared. Boy, that didn't take very long. That did not take long for the Young Bucks to make their debut on Collision. Uh, Naughty Delicious says, I'm not watching Collision tonight, and I don't know if I'm going to watch All Out tomorrow. This CM Punk breaking news is underwhelming. Uh, Jazz Jackrabbit says, CM Punk has been banned from Collision and Dynamite. Naughty Delicious says, I'm honestly conflicted. My head says the decision is understandable because of the track record from Punk, but my heart feels disappointed. Ricky Starks, Powerhouse Hobbs, Andrade, Samoa Joe, Roosh, House of Black, Bullet Club Gold. On and on and on. Better be protected. This is my last super chat about AEW tonight. Moving forward for Tony Khan, he needs to end the backstage politicking once and for all. It needs to die in AEW. And, and that's one of the things I, I will talk more about tomorrow. Because it's not enough to just get rid of CM Punk, right? That takes care of the Punk problem. But there still is another problem here that needs to be addressed to make sure this sort of thing does not happen again. It doesn't just end with CM Punk. Metal Rules with the uh, $50 bomb six hours ago. Has it really been six hours? I guess it has. CM Punk, you're fired, says uh, Tony McCon. Mr. Notorious Chico, I know this might not be true, but do you think Punk wanted to get fired so he can go to WWE, especially after he went to Raw earlier this year? I don't believe it, no. I don't believe that CM Punk came back to AEW and had Collision all to himself and had Ace Steel come with him, got Ace Steel to, I guess he lost, did he officially lose his job and then got his job back? Or did he never get fired in the first place? I think he got his job back. I don't think he, he does all of those things because he wants to get fired. I think when the all-in situation, when the brawl-in situation happened last weekend, I think he was probably of the mindset like, fuck this, I don't want to be here anymore. But do I think this whole thing was him just over the months wanting to get fired from AEW? No, I don't believe it. Nor do I believe he has some sort of inside line to WWE where he knows he would get a job. It's not a guarantee that WWE will want to take him back. Naughty Delicious says, if only Finn Balor and Damian Priest were coming out to the entrance wearing Baltimore Ravens jerseys to anger the Pittsburgh crowd. Uh, Theodore Bond, have some of my Canadian dollars. I will happily take your Canadian dollars. You know what else I like? Canadian bacon. James Cooper with the 1999. As a punk mark, good move by Tony Khan. 
Dude needed to show some balls. Punk was an asset, but the problem is he overreacts and takes payback too far. He should have been an adult and let it go. Real men know when to let it go. I mean, for all these years, we all, you know, people wondered what does the CM stand for and CM Punk. And he used to joke that it was for Cookie Monster and it was Chick Magnet. This entire time, it was Chicago Malcontent. Dr. War God, CM Punk deserved to get fired, but Jack Perry shouldn't be forgotten in this in a 30-day suspension and total loss of push. Feels appropriate for Jack Perry for being the primary instigator. Uh, the Barf Nuggets, 24. Who is going to ban us from Collision now? Well, we'll keep Punk here in the uh, Super... Punk, Punk will still be here in the Super Chat to ban you from Collision. Merlot Williams, Trish and Becky, match of the night. Nakamura should have won. There should have been a cash-in uh, with that build. Punk on WWE TV this week with the real-world title blurred out a la Flair in the 90s. I can guarantee you that will not happen. Uh, Rizzo with the 20 bucks really enjoyed payback tonight. A little surprise with the Seth back injury played up so much that Priest didn't cash in. In regards to Tony Khan and CM Punk, I believe Tony Khan did the right thing. I have a poll up. I, I didn't even mention this, but in the live chat, I have a poll up asking, do you agree or disagree with Tony Khan's decision to fire CM Punk? And we have almost 2,400 votes in the poll. 78% of you agree with the decision. Only 22% disagree. So there are a lot of people who agree with that decision. Aussie of Steel. Really good show all around. Did not expect the cage match to be that good. All around, it was a better pay-per-view than SummerSlam. Would you agree? You know, I was thinking about that, and I, I think it was, it was up there with SummerSlam, because SummerSlam was not a great show. And so, is it better than SummerSlam? I think it's I think it's right around the same spot, probably, where I would have ranked SummerSlam. Uh, Erasmo Sol has really enjoyed the show. Salud, my friend. Salud to you two. Calio, CM Punk banned from Collision. Uffman says everyone is unbanned from Collision. That's right. That's true. Everybody who has been banned from Collision is now unbanned. RB065, so no ice cream bars. I guess not. ABK with the $100 super chat, so I am not banned for a collision. Now, you are, you are officially unbanned from collision. Bobby's World, no, we can't all be unbanned. I haven't had a chance to get banned yet. There we go. There you go. Thank you for the seven. The seven will still be there. Seven will still be there for those of you who wish to be banned. Zachariah Sitchin with Jay. It is a good plot twist to draft Cody to SmackDown, but I wish they would have pulled the trigger sometime around the Rumble or the earliest Survivor Series. Uh, Dallas says Nakamura carried Rollins. Seth is basically Super Cena with dives and super kicks. Uh, Zachariah says the tag titles and Becky and Trish were the best matches of the night. I did not mind the main event. It was an all right shift from the drama of the Bloodline story. Not a strong ending, I agree, but it was all right. Yeah, I mean, that's my problem with it, I guess. For a pay-per-view main event, it was only all right. And then you had that little awkward ending there. It was just, uh, yeah, I don't know. It was just bizarre that he's, he's down on all fours with a bad back. And you have a guy in the back who has a briefcase who could cash it on this crippled man and doesn't even tease it. But look, there's always Raw Monday night, I guess, right? Although I don't know if they would do anything that big on the Labor Day show. Anderson Blitz, looking back, Triple H burying Punk in 2011 was good. Well, let's not forget what uh, John Moxley had to say. The prophetic words of John Moxley when they feuded last year heading into All Out. We'll talk about that on the podcast. Paul Hamilton, again, thank you for that 150, man. Paul, I don't know if Paul's with us still or not, but says it was nice to see Becky and Trish knock it out of the park. Yes, indeed. Uh, Mission Impossible. 
And by the way, if anybody is, uh, if anyone is getting any, uh, ads, let me know, because you shouldn't be. That's like, it's a new thing that YouTube just enabled, which is, I think it kind of happened without me approving it. Um, but I have, I have a way to turn them off during the live stream. So just let me know and we'll, we'll try to get that fixed for tomorrow. Uh, Mission Impossible says uh, nothing. <laughs> Just drops three bucks. Thank you. Uh, Dennis Beagle or Beigel. I'll say Dennis Beigel. As someone from Chicago, I'm hoping we get ECW One Night Stand hostility levels tomorrow. We'll be in attendance as a pro punker. Uh, I don't know. Based on what I was hearing from people as far as tonight in Chicago, there were some boos, but it wasn't anything to... Uh, too terrible. Jazz Jackrabbit says CM Punk, end of an error. Ah, uh, I see what you did there. Juan Ocampo with the five says, for all that are celebrating the firing of Punk, I hope you keep the energy for when another person starts issues. Drama won't end because Punk left. Uh, Devin from NJ says, Ding Dong Muffin Boy is gone. Now that it's over, would you say Punk's AEW run has helped or hurt his legacy? Uh, it, it hurt. It hurt his legacy. It's an embarrassing way for his run there to come to an end. So for all the good that he did in AEW, and all the business accomplishments he helped that company attain, it is, in the end, going to be something that people, you know, when they look back on his legacy, it's going to be a stain on his legacy. How could it not be? How could it not be? All the good he did, he he un, undid all the good that he did, just by the way he acted. And it didn't have to be that way. Chris AXC. Jay just uh, did a run in here with Bree Mode. <laughs> Tony, thank you, man. Thank you for the update. Again, let me know, because I know some people are getting ads, and that's a new YouTube thing, but I can turn it off. I could turn it off and go manually when the stream is over. It'll it'll cost me, but I mean you guys are showing me support during the stream. So I mean I could turn them off uh during the live stream. I could probably make it so it's permanent so it doesn't happen anymore. But yeah, you can thank uh you can thank the YouTube gods for that. Chris though says, so when do we find out that Cody negotiated a trade to SmackDown for Jay Uso so he could get Roman and finish the story? It's exactly what I said. I said there's got to be a method to the madness. ABK with that second, look at this, the $205 bomb from ABK. I think that's uh, that's deserving of another ABK shout here. It's ABK. Always be killing it. it. Says Kevin and Sammy against Priest and Finn. Match of the night. EJ Slemp says, all the drama and tragedy lately has burned me out. I will be taking a break from wrestling, but not from the podcast. I will always support you solo. EJ, thank you. I, I know EJ was, uh, or is, a uh, punk guy. So I'm sure this is, this is all very disappointing. It is very disappointing. I think no matter which uh, side of the aisle you're on, you can't say this whole situation didn't end up being a gigantic disappointment. Bones Jones, 99% sure Dom's elbow shot made KO bleed. It's possible. I, I didn't see. I didn't see it. I didn't see how uh, the elbow connected. So it's possible it was hard way. I just looked at it and said, "Man, in a match with this stipulation, and him wearing a Terry Funk shirt, and he bleeds, it's quite the coincidence." Uffman says, "What's? Uh, yeah, we just answered that." M. Jackson, do you think Danielson is prob properly healed, or will they use the strap? Oh, yes, so let me, uh, I guess I didn't mention this, but they did an angle on Collision tonight, where Ricky Starks was going to call out Ricky Steamboat and challenge him to a strap match at All Out. And it was pretty clear, Ricky Steamboat is 70 years old. He hasn't had a singles match since 2009. He's not wrestling Ricky Starks at All Out. It sounded to me when they first announced it like Tony Khan thought maybe he'd get CM Punk back and Punk would make this big surprise return. It would be this big moment. Then it became very clear even before he announced the termination, it's probably not going to be CM Punk. 
but he had someone in mind that he thought the fans would be very happy with. And I said, well, maybe, I mean, it could always be Hangman or someone like that, but like, I, I, I didn't know who else that would be. And they did a segment tonight where uh, Steamboat had a contract that said Ricky Starks against the Dragon. He kept saying, you want to wrestle the Dragon? And he said, yes. And he signs the contract and he goes, well, I promised you a match with the Dragon, but it's not me. And then he brought out the American Dragon. And Brian Danielson came down to the ring. So Brian Danielson, evidently, is healed from his injury. I don't think they would be bringing him back if he was not properly healed from a broken arm. I don't believe that that they would allow that. He's too valuable to bring him back prematurely from an injury like that and risk making it worse. So either they uh, worked us a little bit on the timetable for his return, or he just was able to heal up a lot quicker than they expected. Because they were talking about an October return. Uh, they're going to be in Seattle, not far from where he lives, for Wrestle Dream on October 1st. That's a new pay-per-view. And I think, you know, it sounded like their goal was to get him back in time for the Seattle show, which is a month away. And he came back a hell of a lot earlier than a lot of people expected, but... You know, if it was going to be CM Punk and Ricky Starks, now it's Brian Danielson and Ricky Starks. So that's a hell of a replacement. I can understand people in Chicago being disappointed because they just wanted Punk, but uh, you will get no complaints out of me as far as uh, Brian Danielson being a substitute. I think he's a more than suitable substitute. Michael Cuomo. Uh, when would you say the golden era began and rock and wrestling ended? I would say when DiBiase bought the belt. I I always look at the golden era as being like an 87 thing. So I would say the rock and wrestling era ended around, around then. End of 86, beginning of 87. Sean D says Jay is going to win Seth's title, isn't he? Um, no, I don't think so. Dallas, what about Jey Uso beating Gunther if Chad Gable cannot? Um, I don't see that either, but that's more likely than him beating Seth Rollins. Uh, we've got Havili with the six bucks. Can you consider Asuka a curse of the women's division besides Charlotte and Bianca, some of the women who she faces or team up with get pregnant after? Uh, yes, we've talked about this joke before. A lot of people that Asuka has either wrestled or teamed with end up getting pregnant not too long after. Alexa, Carmella, Becky. That's why I said when she was working with Charlotte and Bianca, I said they better watch out. They better be careful. Merlot Williams. Nakamura is just going to keep cashing checks like Balor. Simon Gotch said of Balor, he's on his money run. Unfortunately, that's where he's at. Super Pony. Owens and Zayn should go solo. I can't take another three months of them fighting Judgment Day. KO should beat Gunther, not Chad Gable. No, I, I, I disagree on that. I would rather it be someone like Chad Gable. Kevin Owens does not need to be the one. He, he doesn't gain anything by being the one to beat Gunther. Someone like Gable being the one, though, to beat him and take the championship would be huge for him. So I don't see the need for Kevin Owens to be the one to get that spot when Chad Gable is right there and putting in the work and absolutely would benefit from a spot like that. Retro KOH CM Pink Slip got banned from Collision. Good riddance. Time for me to make a new avatar. Uh, Havili says, Solo, greetings from Australia. Have a great day. Well, thank you very much. All the way from the U.S. to you in Australia. I thank you. Kevin Henry, January 27, 2014. I left sports entertainment. January 2024. I'm back. <laughs> That's why you always got to be careful. When you leave one place to go to another, Bobby Heenan had it right. Bobby Heenan was the one guy when he went to WCW, he refused to say anything negative about WWE or Vince McMahon because he knew. 
he may end up back there one day. He's not stupid. He may need a job. He made good money there. He made, he made his money there. He was like, I'm not going to burn bridges. I'm not going to piss anybody off. CM Punk, he, he didn't follow that same philosophy. He's had quite a few things to say about his former employer. A lot of it justified. Uh, but it all comes back around at some point. There he is. Rizzo with the $10 uh, super chat. Do you guys think like me that a big what if in wrestling history is going to be what if Punk never broke his foot? Things seem to turn when that happened. It, it's a what if as far as what that summer of Punk would have looked like. Because he and Tony Khan said they had big creative plans for him last year that and we don't know what those plans were. But I think it would have blown up at some point regardless. Maybe not it all out. But it would have happened, because if he had issues with people leaking things about him and he thinks it had to do with Colt Cabana, it was going to happen no matter what. There's one of the new Super Chat. <laughs> there it is. There's footage of the choke from Wembley Stadium. I got exclusive footage here on this channel. You won't find it anywhere else. Anti-M Bishop heard payback was good and Tony Khan showed balls tonight on and off the air and firing Punk. It is, it is what it is. It's been a long two years. The one thing about CM Punk that I will say is he is exhausting. Just talking about him and covering, it's just it's just exhausting. He's an exhausting person. Uh, Zachariah, don't think Punk won't return. Maybe not wrestling, but WWE is running out of names to induct into the Hall of Fame. And WrestleMania is in Philly. Punk would fit right in. Oh, he's going to go into the Hall of Fame one. Whether he goes back to have another run and get a WrestleMania main event, he's going to go into the Hall of Fame one. That, that I absolutely agree with you on. Uh, we got 16 pound ham. I believe Punk has narcissistic personality disorder and the further you examine his behavior under that lens, the more it makes sense. See here, I thought he had what Randy Orton had years ago. He had that uh, IED. Is that, that what Randy Orton called it? He had that IED disorder. Ty Sloam. Do you think Punk WWE return possible? Possible, yes. Likely, no. One buck. With the five bucks. Should have super chatted me about the young bucks. What are the odds that Adam Copeland debuts it all out? Uh, zero. He is still under contract for the rest of this month to WWE. Uh, Ken Masters, thank you for the super chat. Eagle Shadow, thank you for the nearly 13 bucks. Eagle Shadow also with another six says, even with Punk being my fave, I agree with the decision to fire him. His behavior has been a sour uh, for a while now. I do believe Jack Perry should receive disciplinary action as well, however. Retro says, Crazy Muffin Man Punk will sign with Mindy's Bakery. Ken Masters, who was the bigger headache to work with, Punk or Warrior? Uh, just based on the stories that people have told that actually worked with these people, Ultimate Warrior. I don't think I've ever heard a single positive story about the Ultimate Warrior as far as working with him, being in the locker room with him. Now, I know he was friendly with some people. He and, he and Randy Savage got along but it's just one negative story after another. Ty says, do you think Edge goes to AEW? I think he's in a much better position to do so now, but you put me on the spot. Do I think he goes? I think he stays with WWE. Jay from New Jersey with the uh, $25 Bree mode. I've been away from wrestling ever since Peacock made Comcast customers pay. Sounds like Collision had more bands than Solomonster's Stream. If Punk signs to WWE, I'll personally give you a pastrami on rye from Cats. Cats Deli, man. I'll take that. Give me a pastrami on rye with some mustard. Some chicken soup to go with it, man. I'm good to go. 
Yuri with the 10. I've loved Punk since the Ring of Honor days, but we all know it probably is for the best. His nonsense is unneeded and unnecessary. Others were at fault too, but he is the one that stepped everything up. Again, to me, it all boils down to putting your hands on somebody. And if they have proof that Punk is the one who instigated the physicality, it doesn't matter what words in a three-second comment on pay-per-view came out of the kid's mouth. If Punk is going around and, and starting the physicality and pushing and slapping or shoving, you can't do that. You just can't. That's the minute you lose the argument. You're trying to be a leader. You want to set an example, right? They've said that he's trying to make it that Collision has a drama-free locker room. He wants to lead by example. That's not how you lead by example. That's how you lead and show people how it's not done. That's what people don't understand. I mean, Tony Khan does not make this decision unless those reports about Punk getting physical or instigating it or going after him have validity to them. If all those reports are fake news, Tony Khan does not fire CM Punk. But again, some people, they don't want to accept reality. The Golden Lovers here with the $1.99. Can you please smack down 1999 song like last night? There you go. There you go. I should start performing. I'll, I'll start singing like Fozzie. I'll have concerts and stuff. Uh, Dr. Bropio, time can never mend. Careless whispers of a good... Fr oh, good lord. <laughs> Cheers to the mods and the chat. Thank you, Dr. Bropio. Taylor with the 999. Payback was fine. Rhea deserves better. Too bad about Punk. He's great on TV. Was hoping he would influence the product, but clearly problems with Phil Brooks. Hopefully Tony Khan makes this a turning point. It just sucks. It does. It does suck. Scotty Clash says, Punk was a childhood hero of mine. Straight edge like him, but his actions have made me lose all respect for him. From Chicago as well, it makes me sick. Darth Panic. Tony Khan gets a lot of flack for being soft. Do you think a young Vincent Kennedy McMahon Jr. was the same way when he first took control from his father? <laughs> the way he stomped out all the territories? I'm going to say no. He's He's been a ruthless SOB from day one. Uh, we've got Kalios. It feels weird knowing that I was present for what is now known as CM Punk's final match at AEW All In. And so much chaos happening during it. Game Torny Forever. Hypothetical. What would your reaction be if Punk showed up at House of Glory? <laughs> I don't think that's going to happen. I don't think that's going to happen. If it does, though, I, I probably will. I'll, I'll put on my uh, glasses and mustache. Put a wig on. Uh, Game Torn, he says, do you think Theory is approaching go-away heat? He is starting to get there with me. It's not go-away heat, it's just he's he's just very boring. Very one-dimensional. You know, he can work. Kid can work. But he's just very dull. Uh, Yuri says, now that Punk is not all elite, who do you see filling his role? Obviously, he's a megastar against someone that they could build. Who do you see taking that spot? I don't know if Brian Danielson being on the show tonight is any indication of that. And obviously, he's part of the Blackpool Combat Club. I could see Danielson filling that role, at least temporarily, as the veteran who kind of takes the lead as, as sort of the leader of that roster and the leader of that show, the face of that show. Uh, I could see Danielson being that guy. Yeah, I joked before about Edge. I, I don't think that Edge is going to end up going to AEW, but... I mean, shit. If Tony Khan wanted to make a play for Edge to bring him in and make him one of the one of the faces on Collision. Uh, yeah, he doesn't have to be there every week. But I think Danielson is somebody who... he He's a leader. He's somebody who can lead by example who I think would be a good influence on that roster in that role. 
And if I had a vote, my vote would go to him. I actually think Samoa Joe would be uh, very good in that spot too. Is somebody that you can have on that roster to be sort of the calming influence and the leader type. There it is again. Exclusive footage. Ty Sloam, I'm surprised that the AW locker room does not hate Chris Jericho. How do you know they don't? How do you know there aren't people that don't? Yuri, just a light one. Why the hell is New York so cold in August and September? We need punk to brawl out with global warming and mother nature. Well, you just came to New York at the wrong time. I mean, it's going to be, I think, 88 degrees tomorrow. I'm going to be sitting here tomorrow recording the podcast, sweating my balls off. And then I got another podcast with the uh, All Out stream later tonight. Yes, I said later tonight because it is 2.15 in the morning. Uh, Zeno Slayer with the $20 Super Chat. Zeno Slayer, thank you. If AEW would do like WWE Peacock model to rewatch the old pay-per-views with Max, which one would you watch again? I probably would go for All Out two years ago. That was the show where we got CM Punk's first match, we got Adam Cole's debut, and we got Brian Danielson's debut. And we got that great cage match with the Young Bucks and the Lucha Bros. That may be the best pay-per-view they ever did. Ty says, imagine Brock Lesnar in AEW. <laughs> I, <laughs> I'll tell you one thing. One person who would not put up with... I, I'd love to see CM Punk pick a fight with Brock Lesnar. I'd pay good money to see that. Lion-O. Uh. And there's Mumura. Uh, Libido Bell, thank you for the uh, $25 Bree mode. I'll get to you in a second. lion -O says, did Tony Khan fire CM Punk by saying, you're out of touch, I'm out of time? I don't, I don't think he did. Sean D, if Punk shows up at Hog, just dress in denim. I think on that day, the... Uh, the House of Glory uh, Board of Directors may be having a uh, its annual meeting, so I, I may not be able to attend. Uh, the Winston Slip name is from a shortcut that I used to take to get home from work faster. The trip home sucks much less these days thanks to the Solomonster sounds off. Any way I can help you guys pass the time, there you go. Harvey in the chat, uh, the show was good. The show was good, and uh, there were two great matches on the show. So when you restart the stream, you'll find out what they were. Zachariah. Maybe Tony Khan should have given Punk one of those awkward hugs that he gives Claudio, or he gave Claudio, and then Punk's heart would kind of grow, grow three sizes. Here's another five spot. Have a good night. I remember that awkward hug at the scrum that he gave to Claudio. Even Claudio, I think, kind of had a look on his face like, is this guy for real? Uh, Libido Bell. Pissy Pamper Punk. I had the Cult of Personality theme before the Pepsi Man did. That was my entrance song for my caw in SmackDown vs. Raw 2010, and to this day, no one believes. Uh, always in my mind. Yeah, Brian Keith, uh, was on Rampage. He was against, uh, Hangman, I believe, right? I didn't get to see it. So I haven't watched it yet, but we had Brian Keith in. Uh, well, I brought him into House of Glory to try to wrestle the title away from Charles Mason. And uh, he didn't get the job done, but he looked impressive. I think he's an ROW guy from uh, Booker T's Reality of Wrestling, I believe. Uh, Yuri says Ryan Nemeth is now the collision guy. <laughs> And Rizzo, I picture you with all your notes ready to sit for the podcast and news breaks and you just stare into the abyss and slowly start going crazy. Yes, I do. And then I hear the song, Hello Darkness, My Old Friend. This has been happening a lot lately. I had a plan for tonight too, by the way. And I was like, mostly settled for tomorrow. And then everything just blew up. And I, I basically have like no notes now for this shit tomorrow. So I don't, I don't know what this podcast is going to look like. We will have all-out predictions, though. I have a lot to say about all-out. We'll talk about that. 
But uh, yes, this this is it feels like this has been happening uh, quite a bit lately. Where I I have a plan, I like to be organized, so I have a sense of what to talk about, and then everything just gets completely blown up. Oh me, but that's that's the way the cookie crumbles sometimes, I guess, right? All right, I think I got through all of your super chats, man. A lot of a lot of good ones in there. A lot of good ones, man. You guys have been uh, treating me well over these last few days, which is very cool. It's been a lot of content, a lot of streaming, and we still got two more straight nights of it because we have a pay-per-view. I'm sure that pay-per-view is going to end very late. And then uh, Monday night we have Raw with the uh, Intercontinental Championship on the line. If Gunther wins, he breaks the record on Friday as the longest reigning Intercontinental Champion of all time. If he loses... It's all over. And a Honky Tonk Man is going to throw a party. Silver Tower. Which Tony Khan hug was better, Okada or Claudio? Claudio, Claudio I think, was the more awkward of the two. So I got, I got to go with the Claudio one. Uh, you smashed the goal for Be the Booker, and you know what that means. Let's go ahead and get it done. Time to Be the Booker. Ladies and gentlemen, it is now time to Be the Booker. There you go. That photo's for all of you guys. The Miz and Maurice. It is time to be the... Hey, Silver Tower, thank you for the emoji. Surprised I'm still up. Yeah, well, it's it's been two and a half hours. We've had a lot to talk about here on this stream. But uh, here we are at 2.20 in the morning, and we still have uh, just shy of 2,000 people hanging out with me here on a very late Saturday night, early Sunday morning, so I appreciate that. Are you guys done staring at the image? Can we can we start this? Okay. Say goodbye to Maurice. <laughs> All right, here we go. Take a cold shower when you're done here with this stream. All right, here we go. We begin with Kane. There it is from the one night that Kane was the WWE champion. He was champion for 24 hours. Kane, the original Kane, one on one with Claudio Castagnoli, the Ring of Honor world champion. Kane and Claudio, two people who are deceptively strong individuals. Kane back in the day, man, I mean, he, he had some pretty impressive feats. And Claudio is just a beast. So, yeah, the original Kane and Claudio, I'd like to see that match. Ring of Honor World Champion against the WWE Champion. How about that? All right, women's be the booker. It's going to be hard to top the uh, cage match that we saw tonight, but we're going to try. Oh, sorry, my, uh, my finger slipped back to Maurice there for a second. Uh, we got Wendy Richter, former WWE Ladies Champion. Wendy Richter, the first screw job. Spider Lady beat Wendy Richter. Long before Brett and Sean, we had Spider Lady. Wendy Richter was one of the faces of the rock and wrestling era. I remember that. It was right around the time that uh, I started watching. Wendy Richter one-on-one -on -one with Dr. Britt Baker, DMD. I mean, look, as far as a marquee match, got the face of the uh, women's rock and wrestling era. Against the face of the AW women's division. And now we go over to uh, tag teams. We always button this up with some tag team be the booker. <laughs> Oni, how dare you? How dare you? Boy, we're seeing a lot of uh, Punk and Jack Perry tonight, aren't we? Poor Jack Perry. We begin with... Stone Cold Steve Austin and Shawn Michaels. They were a tag. They were tag team champions, in fact, in the spring of 1997. It was short lived. They uh, wrestled each other at the King of the Ring that year as tag team champions. Stone Cold and Shawn Michaels are going to be taking on the New Age Outlaws. Three. For three, a very nice recovery from last night where we did not go three for three. 
Road Dogs made another stupid comment, by the way, on his uh, podcast this week. Uh, it's par for the course, I know, but maybe if I uh, have some time, maybe I'll talk about that tomorrow. I've seen a lot of stupid comments this week. Drew McIncock says, uh, sending more Super Chats because you called me Silver Tower. Did I call you? No, I called Silver Tower Silver Tower. Silver Tower sent an emoji before. Uh, Chris Manson, new Be the Booker stipulation. If we pass the likes goal by 200, we get a do-over if it's a buzzer. I'm open to that. Cameron Spencer, what's the most overrated match in WWE history? In my opinion, it's Taker Foley, Hell in a Cell. That match was a piece of trash to me. Wow. I don't know if it's the most overrated match in history. I don't think it's the most overrated, but I I've said I think the Iron Man match from WrestleMania 12 is overrated. And I say that as a Bret Hart fan. I think that is an overrated match. I think people, including WWE, they kind of put it on a pedestal because it was the first. You know, it was the first Iron Man match they ever did. But the way people talk about it, I, I think it's overrated. I remember watching it live. I remember being bored for a good por portion of it. To be fair, I have not gone back in many, many years and watched it. But I would uh, pick that. Rizzo, I may have chanted fire solo when you took Maurice off the screen. So here's five bucks to say I'm sorry and have a good night solo in chat. Thank you. You are, you are forgiven. Austin Tucker is going to fast lane next month. Well, have fun. Fast Lane is the day after my birthday. Which means on my birthday and the day after my birthday, I will be streaming. So I guess that takes care of my birthday weekend. <laughs> and I have a podcast to do that weekend. Good to know. Good to know. Hey, Libido Bell. Thank you. Would love to see Be The Booker stats with an end of month recap. You want to give me more work to do? And Yuri, in regards to New York weather, I am from Long Island. Just wasn't ready. Side note, got to hit a hog show one day. Yes, you do. And uh, September 15th would be a pretty good one, too. We got Low Key is going to be in action. We got uh, El Hijo del Vikingo is back. We got the Vaude Villains. Challenging for the House of Glory Tag Team title. I think that's the first Vaude Villains match in years. And uh, you never know what else or who else may pop up on that show. Yeah, Long I The thing about Long Island is all the wind. Silver Tower wants his membership title back, so Boots needs to be on notice. I don't know. Bo Boots, I think Boots' record is safe. We had one stream last week. I don't remember if it was all in where uh, Boots gifted 120 memberships in one stream, which works out to an insane amount of money. But uh, yeah, I think his record is safe. I don't think he has too much to worry about. All right, that covers the, uh, the Super Chats. Got you all in. So uh, thank you very much for all of the love. It is very late, so I'm going to uh, let you guys go. But uh, yes, a very big day as far as news, and there will be more tomorrow. I'll have a lot more to say on uh, Punk, on All Out. Uh, we'll talk about the fallout from Payback. We will talk about a WWE tag team that is on its way back as early as this week. Who they are and what show they're expected to be popping up on. And a few other news and notes, some stuff on Bray Wyatt and, and uh, some other stuff as well. SNK fan 01 says solo wasn't your birthday last month. Time flies. Unless you know something about me that I don't. My half birthday was in April. My actual birthday is in October. You should know that because October is my favorite month because of Halloween. I always have fun with Halloween. We, we always Halloween up all the streams. So my birthday falls in the same month. And uh, Golden Lovers says, thanks, Solo, for the content. Listening since 2016. Thank you very much, Golden Lovers. Appreciate the uh, long support. So tomorrow is episode 824. Keep your eye out 
Subscribe on uh, Spreaker, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, wherever you download the show. Uh, hopefully it will be up not too late in the afternoon because we have a pay-per-view tomorrow night. That's where I'll be, back here with you live for the All Out stream. Wasn't Carlito supposed to be back as well? He might still be. Yeah, that was, that was Mike Johnson, a PW Insider, who reported that. And Mike is pretty reliable when it comes to those things. I can tell you that when Carlito was at the Hog Show in June, um, what can I say and can I say? There were definitely people uh, who were discussing that at the show. So where he is, he could very well be preparing and they could be holding him out for a particular time. I still say him having something to do with the LWO would make sense on SmackDown, but just because he hasn't showed up yet doesn't mean that he will not, or that he is not under contract. Uffman, yeah, don't worry. Uffman, <laughs> did they put an ad at the end? Oh, fucking assholes. I'm going to take care of that. Yeah, again, that's a YouTube thing. They started doing it where you can put ads in during the live streams, which I don't know why you would do that. But uh, I'll take care of that. I'll, I'll make sure that's not an issue tomorrow night. So I apologize for that. All right, be well. Stay safe. Have yourselves a great night. Thank you for hanging out with me uh, super late. And uh, we'll do it all over again in less than 24 hours. I will see you guys back here for All Out. Until then, have a good night, guys.